Hey everybody, in this video what I want to do is go over Nietzsche's Morgenroute or Daybreak, sometimes it's called the Dawn of the Day. Let's get to it. Alright everyone, what I want to do now is we find ourselves uh, more entrenched in uh, Nietzsche's middle period, so we're now in the 1880s, and we're going to start here with uh, Daybreak by Nietzsche. And you know, I, or the you know the the coming of the dawn, uh, or the uh, beginning of the you know the, the rise of a new sun. That's what this is meant to evoke. You'll notice the subtitle today, break is thoughts on the prejudices of morality. So the moral thesis of Nietzsche that I talked about in class uh, several weeks ago, where uh, when we look at the history of certain terms. We come to some conclusions about the history of morality, like where morality has come from as we understand it presently in this age. He starts to really develop that thesis here. It's really a Nietzsche from the beginning. You can kind of see uh, elements of it in as far back as the, the birth of tragedy. But uh, he's continuing the development of that thesis here to see, like, here, here's what's wrong with the morality uh, that we have today as we conceive it collectively, uh, especially coming from uh, the Christian tradition. This is the way, uh, this is the, the history, what he'll later call the genealogy of morality. It starts to, to, to more clearly get where he's going. Here uh, we're going to see that culminate in uh, the genealogy of morality itself. It's also in uh, his Beyond Good and Evil. And to some degree also in the Antichrist also, but a little bit indirectly. So First of all, let's take a look at the opening section here, and I'll be dancing around this one. I'm still in our textbook. This is now on page 191, where Daybreak begins. First paragraph here. Uh, the concept of morality as custom. Uh, Hume says something similar about morality. It's just something that we, we, we most of us, our moralities, <laughs> our conceptions of morality are, have more to do with habit or habituation than truth, which is to say most of the things that we uh, like morally or prefer, we, pref we like them or we think they're right or good or true simply because they're familiar to us. Think about this with uh, certain, uh, what I'll call not moral, but practices of that become normal to you. You begin to think of your regular habitual practices sometimes as correct. So uh, if you're in a house, <laughs> if, you, if you grew up in a house where when you go inside you take off your shoes and you go to someone else's house where they don't take off their shoes when they go in their front door, you kind of look down on that because the habits that you possess you think of as good or right or true. Maybe not objectively so, but often with our morality as a culture we end up doing the same thing. The things that we normally regularly do, we take a, we look at those things as a normal, regular, good, right, and true, and people that don't share those uh, conceptions precisely as we do, we tend to condescend because of custom. So what does Nietzsche say? In comparison with the mode of life of, whole, of the whole millennia of mankind, um, we present-day men, <laughs> mention, live in a very immoral age. Now that seems like a weird thing to say. You, when we look at the 19th century, we might think it's almost incensed uh, with morality. Uh, it's a f uh, fixed idea, or fixed idea, uh, like an obsession. Like you think of when you think of the Victorian age. Granted, you know, Germany is not in, within the domain of Victorian England, but we think of it. The 19th century is almost as uh, obsessed with morality. And even when you look at a lot of the religious literature of the time. Uh, with the advent of science, a lot of uh, religious thinkers start turning to, really start conceiving of religion as almost the domain of morality. In varying degrees, I could think of everybody from uh, Scottish thinker Joseph Butler, uh, in England William Hewell, uh, 20th century, but Albert Schweitzer would follow this tradition to some degree. 
Christian theologian. I think you, we could see it in Schleiermacher uh, to a degree as well. 19th century, uh, granted before Nietzsche. But this notion of, well, but really the focal point of religion ought to be morale, not the theology so much, you know, what, what are the, what are the, what's the nature of God? What's, what kind of substance is the divine? Things like that, but um, what is the nature of what we ought to do? The moral question, that's really what religion is reducible to at the end of the day. That's, that's not there in all 19th century uh, religious literature, but, it, but it's there certainly more than in previous centuries. But Nietzsche then saying that this is in a moral age, it's kind of a peculiar thing to say. What does he mean by that? Well, we'll come back to defining exactly what he means by that. But at this point, I'll just say briefly, he's saying that there's a lack of a moral sense in the classical sense of what morality perhaps was in the ancient world, like we talked about in class. The power of custom is astonishingly, astonishingly enfeebled and the moral sense so rarefied and lofty, it may be described as having more or less evaporated. That is why the fundamental insights into the ori origin of morality are so difficult for us latecomers, and even when we have acquired them, we find it impossible to enunciate them, because they sound so uncouth, or because they seem to slander morality. This is, for example, already the case with the chief proposition, morality is nothing other, therefore, no more than obedience to customs. That's it. Nietzsche just define morality for you. What is morality? Uh, basically, obedience to customs, keeping with tradition in a particular kind of sense. That's what morality is. We have our, in our, whether it be in our families, larger groups, <laughs> society in general, our countries, cultures, nations. Morality is nothing other than the obedience to customs. So what we do when someone else does something that we think is immoral, you haven't, you haven't yielded to, you have not obeyed the customs that we possess. Okay, now sometimes you might think, well, what, what is it? Mur murder is wrong. Someone committed a murder. That's, that's not just obedience to customs, that's wrong. Well, we have different definitions of murder, too. That is not murder in the second degree, but murder as well. So, uh, if we look at murder as the killing of human life, a, a general term, we could also then come up with exceptions to that. Ah, it's not murder if you're doing something in self-defense. It's not murder, uh, perhaps, if it's an execution. Well, that's, for many years, that was considered the case, uh, that executions or capital punishment are not murder. Uh, whereas today, you see uh, some resistance to that that you wouldn't have seen several centuries ago. Uh, we even try and make, uh, even when we do have the death penalty or capital punishment, say in the United States today, we try and make it as humane as possible. So lethal injection, no one gets uh, beheaded by uh, guillotine or the electric chair uh, anymore, at least to my knowledge, uh, or, or hanged or burned at the stake. Why is that? Well, customs have changed. That's not con that would be considered uncouth. Uh, to borrow Nietzsche's word here in the English today, morality is obedience to customs. This is why different societies do things differently, different cultures do things differently. We kind of look at, oh, that culture, they do that, that's weird. Well, the weirdness comes from the fact that it's not uh, in our custom. And that's what morality is. But let's move on. Of whatever kind they may be, customs, however, are the traditional way of behaving and evaluating relative to whatever particular tradition it is that we're looking at. And um, in things in which no tradition commands, there is no morality. And the less life is determined by tradition, the smaller the circle of morality. So that's what morality is. And so where there is no tradition, there are no really, <laughs> there are no really rules. Uh, that's, that's also why I'm saying a new discipline comes out or uh, something so, so when I say like a new discipline, sometimes it's a new technology, sometimes it's uh, a new situation. When something develops, there's no morality because there's no tradition there. If you find yourself in a situation that you've never been in before, what's the right thing to do? You might look for comparative examples from the past, but when you're in complete new territory, there really are no rules. Because that's the way traditions work. 
there's no tradition. Um, so what I meant by new di- new disciplines there uh, is, uh, you know, whenever there's a new, say, branch of technology or medicine, we have to come up with a new ethics for it. It's not just ready-made and ready to go. If we came up with some new technology, like, is this right? Is this good? Um, for the past couple of decades, like, the, the big one has been uh, in ethics, like, bioethics has been like things like cloning and genetic enhancement. Like, are these things that we should do as we develop them? Like, should we just clone? Like, is that fine? Is that okay? Like, yeah, it hasn't really been done before. Human beings haven't been cloning for you know, ages and ages and ages. It's, it's new. Or genetic enhancement. It used to be you, <laughs> you're born with what you're born with. Now we can uh, enhance that. That's, that's, that's new. We can change things. We can augment ourselves. Ought we do that? There no, doesn't seem to be any really any rules, even if you have some pre-extant moral systems or and situations that you want to compare it to. When you get to new territory, it's kind of uh, open range. Nietzsche continues, the free human being is immoral because in all things he is determined to depend upon himself and not beho- not upon a tradition. So this is a new concept too. The free human being uh, is not moral, does not yield to this old-fashioned way, this tradition do, uh, of doing things, because he is determined to depend upon himself, not upon tradition. This, this um, free person, the person who has Freiheit, is is uh, I was trying to get things to be quiet in the background. Uh, the free person is not moral in the traditional sense, because he's not trying to yield to some particular tradition. Um, and he's depending upon him or herself. In all the original conditions of mankind, uh, let me go ahead and say in this sentence, Nietzsche is now transitioning to that kind of etymological uh, genealogy. Like he's going to say, pay attention to what these words used to mean. In all the original conditions of mankind, evil signifies the same as individual, free, capricious, uh, that means like spur of the moment, unusual, unforeseen, incalculable. So. What, is it, what does the word evil mean? And if you look at uh, the definitions of evil, it means someone who, oh, they're selfish. They do whatever they want. That's spur of the moment. There's no, there's no planning. It's strange. There's no, calcula- you know, there's no calculation. It's just completely, it's chaos. So often uh, uh, there's a juxtaposition of order versus chaos when it comes to uh, the critique of, especially post-Nietzschean, <laughs> since there have been post-Nietzschean critiques on, 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 on morality, uh, uh, especially, and, and you could say Nietzsche is responsible to some degree as a predecessor to aspects of postmodernism that we'll talk about uh, too, but I, I've seen some critiques of that where uh, the critique is, but because of this, <laughs> and, and there are some people that even go back as far as to Martin Luther, that with Protestantism, that began to kind of uh, questioning against authority that has led to the rampant uh, moral decay that we see around us today. I've seen that uh, take as well, but there's a, but people of this take have a juxtapos- juxtaposition of, of order versus chaos, and evil is, th- 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 there's never an endorsement of the chaotic when there's this critique. The chaotic is bad. What we need is order in ourselves, in our communities, and so on. And so evil is that which is chaotic. People that would say up is down, and down is up, and left is right, and right, and, and, and so on. Um, <laughs> white is black, black is white. And that's the chaotic and the disruptive, and that's not right, and neither is it good, nor is it true. So Nietzsche at this point is just told us that's the way evil is typically thought of, that which is chaotic. Individual, free, capricious, unusual, un- unforeseen, un- incalculable. Judge by the standard of these conditions. If an action is performed not because tradition commands, but for other motives, because of its uh, usefulness. If you do something because it's good for you to do. Even if, even indeed for precisely the motives which one founded the tradition, it is called immoral and is felt to be so by him who performed it, for it was not performed in obedience to tradition. So what Nietzsche is saying here is, in the moral systems that we have, you have to, it's not simply that you do the right thing, uh, typically, we, we 
we have a further kind of uh, command, which is that we must do the right thing for the right reasons. So it might be, uh, did you do what you did? Not, did you do what you did because you enjoyed it? Because you liked it? Well, well, that's selfish. You're not supposed to do that. Did you do it because, you know, in a Christian morality, did you do it because you were trying to please God? Or did you do it without even thinking that? But so, like, there's a there's a sense in which this goes back to a kind of Kantian notion of intent as well. Like, are you doing something because you are desiring not just to do it, but to do the right thing for God? Or sometimes it might be it need not need, it need not really be for God. It might be did you do the right thing because you were obeying the king? Did you do the right thing because um, it's what our society would have us do? Does it has to does it have to do with notions of freedom or something like that. We could have modernistic notions about that. Um, so he continues. What What is tradition? It's a higher authority which in which one obeys, not because it commands what is useful to us, but because it commands. So morality typically has this, in, this uh, we can call it this imperative notion. We think of morality as not like what's recommended that you should do, but what you especially in this classic way of looking at it, is what you must do. It commands, not because it's helpful. <laughs> like you might, to, often the so-called moral thing to do might not be the easiest thing to do um, or what you enjoy doing, but what you must do. And <laughs> Nietzsche asks th this question, how is this any different from fear? Consider often religious language, uh, classically at least in English, often describes belief in often a deity as fear. Do you fear God? Um, but Nietzsche asks the question, how is this any different from fear? Being, being afraid. Now, is it fear in the presence of a higher intellect which here commands? Of an incomprehensible, indefinite power of something more than personal? There is superstition in this kind of moral fear. Like, this is the thing we have to do. Why? Well, just because. We're supposed to do it. We have to do it. We must do it. Well, originally, he, he goes on, originally all education and care of health, marriage, cure of sickness, agriculture, war, speech and silence, traffic with one another, with all the gods, belonged within the domain of morality. They demanded one observe prescriptions without thinking of oneself as an individual. <laughs> Excuse me. That's why if you look, <laughs> he mentions this list, uh, all these things. Some of these things on this list you wouldn't think of as being part of morality. Like, who cares, uh, you know, uh, what crops I farm? Personal health. How is that part of morality? Well, what foods do you eat? Now, you, there's a certain sense in which these injunctions kind of continue today. Like, it's morally responsible for you to not to eat things completely filled with sugar because otherwise you'll be <laughs> you'll have some health issues as a result uh, is marriage a part of morality well we still have legal aspects about it what he's getting at is this look at any kind of ancient uh, religious tradition say the Christian tradition I think that's what Nietzsche has in mind and open up a book like Deuteronomy or Leviticus what you're gonna see is a, a lot of very specific codes about the clothes that you can wear Things that you can eat, things that you're supposed to do, what a marriage, <laughs> what a marriage and a wedding looks like, wha how, wha what the limits of that are, how you're to deal with disease. Okay, so like in a book like Levit Leviticus, if someone has, <laughs> just look at say like the just uh, <laughs> look at, look at a book like Leviticus and just look up the word discharge, uh, especially when it comes to bodily discharges. There's a lot of descriptions of that and what you're supposed to do, uh, and how. Even you're supposed to talk things that you can say. All those now we wouldn't think of those things. I don't think to the same degree to be regulated as such today. For example, we have freedom of speech. Uh, in fact, I will be putting uh, a little bit of a piece up by Slavoj Žižek, where he is, is from his book *The Fragile Absolute*, where he describes basically modern. Uh, liberal morals, like things like freedom of speech, uh, freedom of expression, um, 
all, all those kinds of things as freedom of the press, all, all, really as inversions of Christian morality. You might think of them as kind of in conjunction with it, but he has uh, a, a piece or a section in his book, The Fragile Absolute, where he talks about how modern uh, liberal secular morality is actually an inversion of Christian virtues. It's a very, uh, I think, uh, interesting take there, but I'll, we'll get to that here. But he's saying morality used to regulate a lot more, and it seems like today in the modern age, we don't like, like we might think of ourselves as traditionalists when it comes to morality. Oh, we do things the old fashioned way, uh, the way that God would have us do. But when we look back, in all honesty, you're, you're probably not regulating in the same sense that ancient people did. Morality doesn't, in, doesn't encroach into the same parts of life as it might have done classically. Furthermore, the, the bottom line was to not be reflective about it. It wasn't, you didn't do it, the, you, you weren't supposed to think about this, but just simply do. Just do these particular behaviors. Don't think about it too hard, but just, just do it. There's no, there's not, there's no sense of, well, Kant uh, uses the word autonomy a lot. Uh, what, what is autonomy? Literally, auto meaning self and nomos meaning law, like self-law, as opposed to heteronomy, uh, other law, someone else told me what to do. And Kant's morality here, and here Nietzsche is in some, just on this point, uh, maybe owing a little bit to Kant, uh, in that, uh, with, with the notion of autonomy, I don't think he likes Kant's n d d definition or description of it, but at least with the, the basic concept, self-law, that it, rather than be a law being imposed on us, we make laws for ourselves. Now, of course, with Kant, the, the third uh, formulation of the categorical imperative that we're always, you know, legislating members in a universal kingdom of ends, Nietzsche doesn't want anything to do with that. <laughs> we are our own kingdom for ourselves. Our own empire of ends unto ourselves. At, le at least perhaps we ought to be. But there's no... Th there's th what Nietzsche doesn't like is the lack of reflection here. The lack of thinking. Uh, originally, therefore, everything was custom. And whoever wanted to elevate himself above it had to become a lawgiver and medicine man. And the kind of demigod, that is to say, he had to make customs. So when people want to change things, they have to make themselves into significant figures. Uh, it's hard to do. So think of, you know, religious leaders that made changes. Uh, you might even think of uh, Jesus of Nazareth here. Okay, he's going to say, well, and, and keep in mind that say someone like Jesus of Nazareth doesn't really do anything out of accordance with the Judaic tradition. At least, at least in terms of his moral prescriptions. So you know, you could think of, you could look at, um, say, the Sermon on the Mount, Ma Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. You know, uh, and and elsewhere, what is the greatest commandment? Love your, love your God, love your Lord with the, all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Huh? That's neat and different. And sometimes you'll even see where. Um, people put this at odds or at attention with, say, the the Hebrew Bible, or Christians would call it the Old Testament, and say, that's different from the Old Testament God. Nope. Go look in, you know, where you see that expression, love your neighbor as you love yourself? It's in, it first occurs in that book of Leviticus, the book of all the moral prescriptions. Uh, that's where it first appears, so that what Jesus is saying there is not anything out of accordance with what you've seen previously. So, um, that's, uh, nevertheless, in spite, in spite of that case, that there is a, there's definitely a continuity there. Uh, it's certainly the case that at least Jesus was perceived as doing something, um, new and that there certainly were traditions, uh, Sadducees, Pharisees, Zealots, um, Essenes, there were various uh, Jewish traditions that didn't really appreciate exactly the way Jesus was going about things, certainly, I think, historically. So he ended up dead, okay? Uh, Socrates in Athens, going around asking questions, challenging the morality of the time, like, oh, you're, 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 you're rich, but do you have wisdom? 
Let's ask you some questions. Do you really know what you're talking about? Hmm, it seems like people are going around boasting about things they don't know about. All right, Socrates, that's very interesting, and, and now we're going to kill you. <laughs> uh, and so he was executed basically for being disruptive. Jesus was executed for being uh, disruptive. And so when people kind of go against the grain, I even if they do it, uh, even if something great happens afterward, that kind of disruption usually ends in at least immediate failure. Uh, and that's why you have to, to make customs is a dreadfully dangerous uh, thing to do. But even there, people start following it in a certain kind of trajectory. So how do you become moral? Okay, and even, like I said, even there, uh, with, say, Socrates and Jesus, they're appealing to something else. The point is that challenging things can be disruptive. Go try and challenge all the morality around you. See how people respond. Well, F Foucault will say, you'll probably be incarcerated uh, and, char and considered mentally ill if you go against the grain of whatever moral uh, atmosphere you find yourself in. So how do you get to this? Uh, how should we approach this today? Um, Nietzsche is not going to recommend being like Jesus or uh, Socrates, two people he doesn't like, because while well, there's that bold aspect of, yeah, they were going against the grain of their society, doing something different, the virtues which they espouse are not ones which uh, Nietzsche will be fond of. So, who can be like a, a Brahmin? Uh, this is something in, uh, that's a caste in, uh, you might think in Hinduism. I'm, I'm going to say in Vedanta, uh, where you've got the highest caste that determines what, it's like the, the priestly caste that determines, in, in that case, what, 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 uh, what um, Dharma is going to look like. So, uh, and if you look at, say, um, the Brahmins and the Upanishads, what obeying one's dharma looks like and there are particular prescriptions for that and dharma is just like w w the dharma is the role for your caste in Vedanta or what you might call Hinduism uh, and the in this sense the moral man is the one who obeys it even when it's difficult to obey it the most moral man is the one who sacrifices the most to custom all right that's what it means to be like moral pious even holy what will you would you be willing to die for these traditional values and um that ends up being about a notion of uh, obedience and nietzsche finds this peculiar uh and, um <laughs> there we go those moralists, on, I'm going to skip down a little bit more, and I want to move on to this. Those moralists, on the other hand, who, following in the footsteps of Socrates, offer the individual a morality of self-control and temperance. What morality is really about is controlling oneself, okay, as a means to his own advantage, as his personal key to happiness, are the exceptions. And if it seems otherwise to us, that is because we have been brought up in the after, in their after effect. They all take a new path under the highest disapprobation of all advocates of morality of custom, they cut themselves off from the community as immoral men and are in the profoundest sense evil. Thus to a virtuous Roman of the old stamp, every Christian who considered first of all his own salvation appeared evil. Everywhere that a community and consequently a morality of custom exists, the idea also predominates that punishment for breaches of custom will fall before all in the community, that supernatural punishment whose forms of expression and limitations are so hard to comprehend and are explored with so much superstitious fear. So what he's saying here is this. One of the ways in which the Socratic morality and the Christian morality were new is he's saying they're surprisingly selfish to themselves. What I mean by that is really, really ancient morality, while rooted almost always in well, superstition of some kind or mysticism of some kind, definitely in the supernatural of some kind, is very often communally oriented morality. Uh, I think I mentioned before Peter Sloterdijk has a great uh, description of this in the early pages of his book uh, Bubbles, Spheres Volume 1, where he talks about morality in the ancient world basically is it's kind of like a communal immune system. That's the function of morality. So when people are going, when people, morality is developed to go 
hey, that person is doing something that's going to disrupt the community. Let's kill them so they stop disrupting the community to protect the community itself. But when you look at ancient moralities, whether it be, say, the, or, the original Hebrew morality as put forward in the Torah, or even something like um, Kongsi, or Confucius, Confucian morality, even Vedanta, uh, the Hindu morality that you see in the in the Vedas and the Upanishads and even in parts of the Mahabharata, like the uh, Bhagavad Gita. What you see in those is you, you do what you're supposed to do for us, okay? We all are part of this community. And while certainly Socrates and later followers of Socrates will have a sense of the polis or the community is important. Uh, I mean, this is why Socrates refuses to uh, when, he, when people try to break him out of jail in Crito, he says, no, 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 I can't do this. If these laws could talk, there's still a sense in which he's obedient to the community. And Christians have a sense of the uh, ecclesia. Um, that is, that's the Greek word for church. Uh, you might, if you see it, iglesia in Spanish, very much sounds like that. I mean, it's the word for church. Uh, as the, the congregation, sometimes ecclesia in Christianity refers to an individual community. Like you might think of like a congregationalist, like when you think of oh, this is what this is the Baptist conception conception of uh, the church as the local congregation, uh, but also there's assumption uh, there's the sense of the ecclesia writ large. So this would be more the Catholic conception, lowercase c, not necessarily Roman Catholic, uh, but of the extent of the church. Nevertheless, you think of a, as part of a community. What makes, however, uh, the post-Socratic uh, morality and the Christian morality strange compared to the ancient world and where it is novel is this idea of the individual self's salvation. The, am I saved? This is a preoccupation with uh, Christianity. Am I saved? Do you have a <laughs> you might hear uh, evangelicals say um do you have a personal relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Like, do you? Um, am I saved? I'm working out my salvation. Or, and that might be a Christian way of doing it, but even post-Socratic, like, am I, am I having, am I exhibiting self-control? Am I seeking virtue? Am I going after wisdom? Again, you zoom back to, say, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. Notions of salvation are always communal. It's not just that, say, when Hashem is speaking to Abraham, like, I'm going to save you, Abraham, I'm going to bring you to Canaan, and all your descendants. Okay, they'll be as numerous as the stars in the heaven and grains of sand, um, and so forth. Like, it's always communal. Or Moses, I brought you, not just Moses, but a whole, the, my entire people out of Egypt. So it's always communal and rarely individualistic. Same thing with other, like, whether it be in the... Uh, like I said, the Upanishads, it's communal. Morality is com communal. Th 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 there's no sense of self in here. Now, sometimes I see this put as, well, this is the, diff this is the difference between uh, cl what was classically called Eastern, Oriental in the sense of Eastern versus Occidental in the sense of Western thinking. Um, and obviously it puts, oh, Eastern people think of everything as communal. Uh, that's why they're more, uh, more given to be collectivist. This, I'm not saying I endorse this argument. In fact, I think it's stupid. But I'm saying I see this propagated. People in the West are more individualistic. We tend to think of things animistically, and we've always been that way. And that's why, for example, the 300 Spartans at uh, Thermopy uh, Thermopylae, or as it's mispronounced, Thermopylae, uh, were fighting against those those Persians that were trying to take away their, their, their liberty. Um, okay. No. Uh, even amongst the Greeks, the original morality was, was communal. We do things for the sake of the polis. To a certain degree, you still see that in uh, Plato's Republic and in Aristotle's politics, even though these are post-Socratic. Uh, even in the ancient... But before that, the polis, the community, is considered much more important than the individual. There's, of course, a relation between those two things, but the community is taken as important. This is why... The, the Romans thought of Christianity as evil. It's doing something new and different. 
it's strange it's weird and this is what happens when morality develops if someone comes up with something new we look at it as weird or odd if you haven't experienced this yet as you get older and new styles of music develop you will have this you will experience this feeling when you hear something new that didn't exist decades before where it might even be it's not that it's bad it's just this is different <laughs> whether it be in uh, we see this often happen I think in the arts at least I do um, so yeah the community used to be central and this individualistic notion is new um, but morality classically understood is this therefore the, the tradition of the community you really can't think of a tradition in a vacuum you can only think of a tradition within the context of a community let's keep going um, the community can compel the individual to compensate another individual or the community for the immediate injury his action has brought upon in its train like if you do something wrong the community will punish you it can also take a kind of revenge on the individual for having a supposed after effect of his action caused by the clouds and storms of divine anger to have gathered over the community but it feels the individual's guilt above all as its own guilt and bears the punishment as its own punishment customs have grown lax each wails in his soul if such actions as this are possible every individual action every individual mode of thought arouses dread it is impossible to compute what precisely the rarer choicer more original spirits in the whole course of history have had to suffer through being felt as evil and dangerous so a couple things here so far one he's saying the community is wh where we get our notions of punishment from so uh, and think about this you 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 hear you might i've seen people act in a visceral way uh where they hear someone committed a a crime let's say the crime is heinous and you might experience a like a visceral feeling of well this person needs to receive the death penalty because or this should happen or they're guilty we need to do this or the, we, we shouldn't let things like that happen all right but even uh even though we meet out first of all it's the communal notion of justice we as a community need to do this otherwise why do we punish what's the what's the function <laughs> Or the purpose, the te what's the teleology of punishment, and without most of the time, like I said, uh, like I've said before, we we think of our notions of uh, retribution as just justice, like it's like it's obvious, like it's self-evident, but it is uh, it's often predicated on a kind of feeling of we need to do this, or this person deserves this. Well, why? How does this punishment, uh, how does this particular punishment actually rectify anything? Does it? If someone kills somebody else and we lock them up in jail for, let's say they were 20, for, for life. So they're going to be in there the rest of their life. They live, let's say they live 80 more years and we as taxpayers are going to pay for every meal they ever have. And we're basically paying for the rest of their life. We're, like we'll, we'll take care of them. And even if you m imagine brutal prison conditions. Why? Does it, does it bring the murdered victim back to us? No. Does it make anybody feel better knowing that someone's in prison? Maybe. Yeah, they're they're in prison. They got what they deserved. All right, they've been executed. They got what they deserved. Why? Well, there's a communal function there, but that, that feeling, and someone themselves, individuals, should feel guilty for going against what the community wants. The point that I want to emphasize there is the notion of community we're going to impose the punishment because the community is angry about something. Uh, even think about the way that we do uh, criminal law. If someone's being prosecuted, they're not prosecuted by some... This is not true in civil courts, but in criminal courts. Who does the... Who's the prosecutorial agent? I don't mean the, the individual. We say the people versus so-and-so. It's not... You might think, yeah, well, sure, it, it's crystallized in the individual of the district attorney or the solicitor or the prosecutor, but it's the people versus so-and-so. The people communally, even when uh, even when you have sort of pre-democratic societies, it's still the notion that the, the community uh, is against you, the individual. And so he's saying here, what? <laughs> what, um, what would original spirits do in this situation? 
in the whole course of history have had to suffer through being felt as evil and dangerous. People that want to do things for themselves. Indeed, through feeling themselves to be so. Because the community is imposed, you should have this feeling of guilt. Uh, Nietzsche is going to say elsewhere, or I'm talking about the notion, he's already kind of mentioned it earlier, about the notion of guilt being kind of made up, where we feel bad. And with that, no, what guilt is, is really this imposition of we've been disobedient to the community, we've done something we weren't supposed to do, and we feel bad about it, and that's something that's been imposed by these moral traditions. Under the dominion of morality, of custom, originality of evil of every kind has acquired a bad conscience. The sky above the best men is for this reason to this very moment gloomier than it need to be. Things have been bad. That's how he's, that's the opening salvo of daybreak. But guess what? It's daybreak. A new dawn is rising. And that's going to be kind of the subtle thesis of this work. Okay, now I want to move forward to, I'm on page 194, about the middle of the page. Uh, section 48, he starts with this quote from uh, what was posted above the temple at Delphi and other places in, Gr in Greece, this Greek expression, Gnothi Sautan, know yourself. Uh, this is sometimes an injunction of Socrates that we, you should know yourself, that we don't really know, we, we don't know ourselves, we don't stop and really self-reflect. So this is an injunction of Socrates. Nietzsche says this about it, know yourself. To really know oneself is the whole of science. That's the entirety. And you can, using science there, uh, in contradistinction to what we think of when we think of science as you know people in lab coats, you know, working with Munson burners and beakers. This is the totality of human knowledge: knowing oneself. That's what really it's about. Um, only when he has attained a final knowledge of all things will man uh, have come to know himself. For things are only the boundaries of man. So, yeah, sure, we need to consider, consider this. He's saying, surely, when we think of science, we think of knowledge of things, substances, the universe. But really what we're discovering when we do that is we're discovering ourselves. We're learning know we, know how we know ourselves. When we learn about the universe, we're also learning about our, our place, my place in it. And so knowing oneself, for that reason, is the totality of science. That's something we'll, we'll come back to uh, in Nietzsche's later works as well, this notion of science and also knowing oneself. But here there's just a, there's a seed of it that's been planted here in Daybreak. Again, the, the, it's not, this book is not called Noon, it's called Daybreak. <coughs> let's, let's take a look at the, the next section here. This is still on 194. The first Christian. And so... Here, he spends a little bit of time talking about uh, Saul of Tarsus, who later becomes Paul, and writes the majority, not all, but the majority of what we see as the New Testament writing. So not the Gospels, I would argue not, not the book of Hebrews, obviously not 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, nor Jude, nor James, but a lot of the uh, epistolary <laughs> writings in the New Testament. Again, not all of them, but many of them. So, and some of which I'm sure you're familiar, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, uh, and there's, there's some more in there too. What do we learn about him? And he's, this, when he says the first Christian, this is to whom he's referring. Paul is the first Christian. You might think, well, didn't Paul come a little bit, even if you've read the book of Acts, didn't Paul come a little bit late to the scene? Sure, but he was instrumental in the development of Christianity as we know it. It's going to be Nietzsche's thesis. So, let's take a look. Uh, and I'm going to jump around here a little bit. I don't want to go into every nook and cranny, but I want you to see what his argument is about Paul. Um, he says, All the world still believes in the writings of the Holy Spirit, or stands in the after effect of this belief. When one opens the Bible, one does so to edify oneself, to discover a signpost of consolation in one's own personal distress, great or small. In short, one reads oneself into it and out of it. So what he's saying here is when Christians read the Bible, it's meant to build up oneself. I mean, you could say also the community, surely, but also in Christianity, especially in Protestant Christianity. Um, well, maybe not especially in Pro Protestant Christianity, uh, but today. But certainly there's a sense in which you should read the Bible for yourself. And, wh and what's the function or purpose of that? to build yourself up, to strengthen yourself. You should be reading your Bible all the time. 
um, putting on the full armor of God and all that. And well, what's what's the source for that edification? It's the text of Scripture. It might involve other practices as well. It might involve prayer. It might it might involve Bible study. But certainly, reading the Bible for oneself is considered very important. And again, <laughs> where what text are you going to look at? Probably the Bible, and probably the New Testament. Um, it, it, if one's a Christian, and read oneself in and out of it. So I can even think of instances where, say, this is not a writing of Paul, but I can think of places where I've heard it said, say, a famous um, line from the Gospels, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever so, whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I've heard, I've seen examples of, say, preachers say, put yourself in there, for God so loved me that he gave his only begotten Son, that if I should believe in him, I won't perish but have everlasting life reading oneself into it, building up oneself. This is what I should know. And there's even been uh, moralizations of other texts where even if you're looking at a character in the Hebrew Bible, or as Christians would call it, the Old Testament, like David. <laughs> um, you know, all right, David killed Goliath because of his trust in the Lord. And he had, you know, how did he kill him? He had, uh, Goliath had armor, which wouldn't have existed at the time. Um, if you read the description of the passage, he has armor from a later era. And he's got, you know, his big sword and all this stuff. How's this little peon David, Dawood, going to take him on? And he pulls five stones from the river for his sling. Pops Goliath in the forehead on his first try. Goliath goes down. So, but, but I've seen stuff like this where, you know, David picked up those five smooth stones to slay a giant. What are the giants in your life? Well, here are the five smooth stones you can give yourself, like th that kind of thing, where I'm going to, when you're reading oneself into it, a lot of this, how am I going to implement this into my life? When, when he, when, and that's what Nietzsche means when he says one reads oneself into and out of it. It also contains the history of one of the most am ambitious and importunate souls who could this be, of a mind as superstitious as it was cunning, the history of the Apostle Paul. So, Paul, ambitious, importunate, superstitious, and cunning. That's how he describes Paul, who, apart from a few scholars, who, who, who apart from a few scholars knows that. He says people don't really think about this. But without this remarkable history, without the storms and confusions of such a mind, of such a soul, there would be no Christianity as we know it we would hardly have heard of a little Jewish sect whose master died on the cross. So, surely, assuming that happened, what made Christianity spread? Paul. Paul is the conduit. Uh, and there are even, there were other, you could, I, I'm hesitant to call them schools, but there are other traditions of Christianity very early on. Uh, you had a kind of more Hebraic sect that was wanted to follow uh, more strict aspects of Jewish tradition, basically wanted a, a much more, uh, there's a sense in which Judaism and Christianity are at odds with one another. I know often when we say the word like Judeo-Christian, we kind of team them up. But that doesn't quite work. But there was, a, there was a, a sect that was much more inclined to maintain, say, Jewish dietary restrictions against, say, things like pork and to obey the Sabbath in a much more Judaic sense. Uh, and you, even, you can even see this described in the book of Acts. It's what caused the first um, church council, the Council of Jerusalem. And basically the question is, can non-Jews be Christians too? Um, to which the uh, leaders conclude, yeah. <coughs> like I said, uh, that's in Acts. I want to say Acts 15, where that Christian council is. But then you've also got other sects, like uh, and these come a little bit later. Uh, there's some Gnostic takes on Christianity. There's a sense in which these are being described in a polemical sense uh, in First and Second John. Uh, the Johannine epistles, you can kind of see it there. Uh, so these are other, there were, there were separate Christian communities, but the one that really seems to grow is the Pauline one, such that the majority of texts in the New Testament that we identify with Christianity as such are Pauline texts. And Nietzsche's making the thesis here that if there had been no Paul, Christianity probably would have fizzled out. 
Paul is the reason for which the propagation of Christianity continued so successfully. How so? Well, he says if this history had been understood at the right time, if the writings of Paul had been read, not as the revelations of the Holy Spirit, but with a free and honest exercise of one's own spirit, without thinking all the time of our own personal needs, really read, that is to say, but for 1,500 years there were no such readers. Like, people, if people could look at this critically, not as the Word of God, okay, the walks day, but as <laughs> here's the history of this, uh, Nietzsche's going to conclude, erratic individual. Christianity would have long ceased to exist. It wouldn't be around anymore. But it caught on. For these pages of the Jewish Pascal expose the origin of Christianity as thoroughly as the pages of the French Pascal expose its destiny and that by which it will perish. Now, that reference to Pascal, Blaise Pascal was a uh, French thinker. Some have called him a mystic. I wouldn't call him a mystic, but he certainly has a sense in which he thinks of... Uh, Christianity is kind of, on the surface of it, it's kind of ridiculous, and that's the point. Um, he's channeling uh, Tertullian there, an early Christian thinker. And maybe uh, some people would throw Kierkegaard into this absurdist bunch. I, I'm not sure I would do that. But Pascal having kind of the sense of, oh, mankind is so erratic. There's a sense in which he has this kind of sense of uh, Pascal talking about passion Pascal's usually seen as kind of, he's a little bit, as the, as the kids would say today, he's a little bit extra. That's what he's saying Paul is. Just a little, he's doing a little, there's a little too much going on there, and he's kind of wacky. Well, let's just leave it at that for now. Um, you can look at, say, say, look at Pascal's wager, where he says, belief in God is basically, it's the best bet you could place. It may, it may not be true or not, but it's the best bet you could place. I'm grossly oversimplifying Pascal's wager there, but I, I think that's all I want to do here. Nietzsche continues, that the ship of Christianity threw overboard a good part of the Jewish ballast, okay? That is, it went and was able to go among the heathen. All right, so he's saying that there's a certain sense in which Christianity dumps a lot of its Jewish ancestry, okay? So that is to say, of course, Christians have the Old Testament, and many Christians still see it as just as much the Word of God. They see it just as much as Theopneustos, uh, that's God breathed or inspired by God. It's just as much scripture, but um, Christians don't have to do as much when it comes to obeying the law of God. Okay, so uh, you know if uh, you're not having to go sacrifice at the temple, you're probably a Christian is probably not as well versed in ways to slaughter a goat or a lamb and to how you burn its entrails. Like this is a, a lot of the text of Leviticus or uh, Numbers or Deuteronomy. Um, there's, there's really less to do. Uh, the, the Hebrew strictures are much more strict. Or Christian, Christians are free in the law. The, the law has been fulfilled in Christ. Uh, that's what he means by the Jewish. There's a lot of stuff that you don't have to do. Um, there's not, uh, you don't have to, you don't engage in Shabbat the same way. You probably enjoy a weekend. You might go to church on Sunday, but you're not doing Shabbat or, or, or the Sabbath in the same way. We're, like, we're not doing anything from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Uh, you're not, you're not going, like I said, you're not, you're not sacrificing at the temple. Granted, there is no temple in Judaism today. The synagogic structure is a little bit different in Judaism today, but we're looking at Judaism at the time uh, that Paul lived. And it was able to go among the heathen. So Judaism also has rules about who you can be around. It's very strict. Like, don't if you expose yourself to to people, you have to, you might be cere you might be ceremonially unclean. Uh, there are all kinds of regulations about that. Like, if you <laughs> like in uh, Leviticus, if you stumble upon dead, a dead body, you're going to need special kind of uh, ceremonious uh, or ceremonial cleansing to be purged from that iniquity. And it is iniquity. Iniquity is something not just that you do, but it's something that you can encounter. Um, but he could go like, and Judaism was already out. There were already Hellenic Jews at the time that were out. That's in fact some of the communities where the Christians would go. Is they would find, you can see this in the New Testament. Well, they'll find Jewish communities in say parts of the Roman Empire and go there, but. Christianity really goes out among the heathen. 
that is a consequence of the history of this one man, of a very tormented, very pitiable, very unpleasant man who also found himself unpleasant. So Christianity spreads because of this man's travels. And that's why if you, open, if you crack open any Bible that has a map in it, you'll probably find a map that shows Paul's missionary journeys and how he's going from city to 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 city, to city, to city. On, se on several journeys. That's why almost all his writings bear the name of a city. Why is it, why is it called the Book of Romans? Written to the church at Rome. Why is it called the Book of Thessalonians? There's two of those. Written to the church at uh, Thessalonica. Why is it called the Book of Corinthians? Written to the church at Corinth. Ephesians, Ephesus, Co uh, Colossians, Colossae, okay? Philippians, Philippi, and so on. Okay, These are places he's been. Usually those all those letters begin with, hey, What's up, y'all? Last time I saw you guys, this went down. Saying like, he's been there. How would he go to all these places? He traveled there. Um, but he considered. But he's a very tormented, pitiable, and unpleasant man who also found himself unpleasant. I mean, consider he says, "I myself, Paul." Uh, there's some places where he says, "You know, I'm we, the apostles, such as myself. We are your guides. Emulate us. Be like us." Elsewhere, he says, "I am the chief of sinners." Uh, the uh, Romans chapter 7 where Paul talks about how much oh I hate this very thing that I want to do I can't do it I hate this unpleasant he suffered from a a fixed idea now that that's that's a that's a phrase that we don't use very much anymore it comes from I want a French uh, fixed idée uh, where we've got what a fixed idea is it's is it's a colloquial way or I won't say colloquial. It's an expression, an idiomatic expression that means an obsession. Like something you can't get out of your mind. So when it's fixed, like there's an idea and it's stuck there. It's fixed. It will not move. It's just right in front of your mind and it's at the forefront of your consciousness constantly. So whenever you see the phrase fixed idea, uh, I, wa I want you to keep that in mind. Like Sterner talks about that in his uh, The Ego and Its Own. He talks about mankind having an obsession with... Uh, the the phantasmic or the the not real what was paul's obsession so just read that there he suffered from an obsession or more clearly from an obsessive question is how i would translate this here which was always present to him and would never rest what's the jewish law really about what is it really like so yeah we got all these dietary you know th things that i'm sure you're basically familiar with don't have mixed, you know, uh, people make fun of these things a lot, but, you know, don't, uh, restrictions, again, you know, kosher restrictions, don't eat pork, don't eat shellfish, um, things like that that seem kind of benign, uh, don't have mixed clothing, don't practice homosexuality, um, keep the Sabbath, the, the Ten Commandments in reduction, if we're going to want to look at the, or the Decalogue in a condensed form, but then when we zoom out and we see the entire of the uh, the mitzvah, the entirety of the law, the commandments of God, what's that all about? Some things in there, we would kind of go, okay, that seems obvious, like thou shalt not murder. That's That seems right. Obey the Sabbath. Keep, keep the Sabbath. Alright, does that mean I'm supposed to enjoy the weekend? Don't take Hashem's name in vain. Don't use it vainly. Okay. Uh, don't make idols. Don't make action figures out of deities. Whether it be other deities or of Hashem. Don't do that. Um, as Sam Harris, who is not a great moral thinker, has, has said, but he uh, certainly has said it, why are, why, are, why are the ones that seem the most objectionable the ones that are first? Okay, I am Hashem. I brought you out of Egypt. Have no other gods. Don't make action figures of the gods. Don't say my name unless you mean it. Keep the Sabbath. Those come first before things like don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, uh, don't commit adultery. Those come first. Uh, and I'll say this, at least for Harris' sake. He, he asks Sam Harris, thinker, wrote a book called um, The End of Faith. Oh, it came out in the last 20 years. His question is, are these really, shouldn't there be, wouldn't a commandment against say, like, thou shalt not rape? Shouldn't something like that be there before? Something like, don't make idols? But nevertheless, it is. Um, so we've got this law, and it's kind of a, Nietzsche's saying here, it's kind of a peculiar thing. Um, 
there are things in there again most some of us would subscribe to don't murder I can get behind that don't steal okay don't make idols hmm. doesn't seem as important but okay but Nietzsche is at least saying here what's what's the what's the deal with the law and how do you and he's also interested in this notion obsessed with the notion of the fulfillment of this law and so he goes uh, he continues by saying that Paul when he was sh before he was Paulos he was Shaul and he was Paul was a Pharisee in fact Paul first makes his appearance uh, in the narrative of Acts as a Pharisee who holds the cloaks of those who so, who stone uh, the disciple who was a deacon Stephen to death. So the first martyr in Christianity is Stephen, who uh, gives a long speech in the Book of Acts. Like it's fairly early on about who who Christ was, and he condemns sort of the uh, the Jewish leaders who confront him about their treatment of Christ, and they stone him to death. And Paul is there. Well, he's Saul at the time, but he's there, uh, and he was apparently a militant uh, Pharisee. And what Pharisees were were the, the easiest way I can put it is they were the conservative Jewish sect of the time. Uh, the resurrection of the dead is real, whereas the Sadducees would say, eh, resurrection of the dead, probably not going to happen. But they have a sense of Jewish tradition. So the Pharisees were kind of the Jewish conservatives, really big on keeping the law. And so because of that, Paul, Paul or Shaul Saul, had an obsession with keeping the law. It was something that he he grew up with. Um, but he goes from being a fanatical defender of the law, perhaps one of the most legalistic um, of the Jewish, in one of the most legalistic of the Jewish sects, we're going to keep the law, we're going to obey it, we're going to preserve it. And part of that mentality was because the reason why terrible things happen to the Jewish people and the Israelites, at least in this conception, is because of the disobedience to the law. This is why the prophets, especially the post uh post fall prophets when i say post -fa post fall of israel and judah because what happens is there's the kingdom of israel it splits in half after the death of solomon into israel and judah and then the prophets come along saying basically there's three phases of prophets the first phase is listen israel and judah if you don't get your act together and obey the law god's going to punish us all of you Israel falls, and just Judah's left. And then there's a phase of prophets going, listen, Judah, you see what happened to Israel? They were destroyed because they didn't follow the law, and we are not either. We're going to get destroyed, too. God's going to be angry with us. Even though we're his chosen people, he's, gonna, he's going to smite us because of our disobedience to the law. And then there's a third phase of the prophets where it's after Judah has been destroyed as well um, by the Babylonians. And with, in the case of Judah, the leadership is taken into exile to Babylon. Where pretty much if you were a Jewish leader, you're going to be, uh, or a leader in Judah, a uh, Judahite, you're going to be brought to Babylon where they lived, I think, for 70 years. And eventually, uh, after the Persians conquer the Babylonians, the Jewish leadership gets to go back 70 years later, and they're back. And they're like, hey, hey, fellow Jews, we've been gone for 70 years. Everything going okay? You ready to follow the Sabbath? And the people are like, what's a Sabbath? And they kind of freak out. And then th that phase of prophets is basically saying, you know why this stuff happened? You know why Israel and Judah fell and the exile happened? Because we weren't obeying the law of God. So if we had just done that in the first place, uh, none of these terrible things would happen. And some scholars would say that's actually what a lot of the Hebrew literature that was seen as prior was written. So something like Deuteronomy 28, where there's... Where there's uh, if you obey my law, all these good things will happen. Followed by Deuteronomy 29, if you disobey my law, all these bad things will happen. So after all these terrible things that happened to the Israelites is when that, or when those codes were written to kind of explain, or I'm not saying that's the case, I'm saying this is the, the typical theorization of how this works, generally construed, that um, where all those, if you obey me, if you keep my commandments, these good things will happen. If you don't keep my commandments, all these bad things will happen, was kind of constructed after the fact to explain why such terrible things had happened to the Israelites and the Judahites. Judahites, <laughs> um, <laughs> there are 12 tribes of Israel. Actually, there's 13 or 14, depending on how you look at it. But pretty much the other 11, after the fall of Israel dissipate, there's one left, the Judahites. 
this is why they're the Jews. They're named after this one surviving group. Interestingly, Paul describes himself as a Benjamite, uh, one of the other tribes of Israel. I, I can't remember where he says that, but I, I want to say it's Galatians. But um, he is obsessed with this notion of the law. Right? That these, these bad things happen. Bad things happened to Israel and Judah because of disobedience. Yet sure, God led them, Hashem led them into uh, Canaan out of Egypt. These people gave them a kingdom and they couldn't keep it. And they couldn't maintain it because of their disobedience. I mean, early on you think of, you know, there's all these episodes where there's these bad kings of Israel or Judah. There's a couple of good ones. You can think of uh, Josiah or Hezekiah or Uzziah, Uzziah until the end. But there's all these bad kings. Ahab, okay, and queens, Jezebel, uh, who are the kings of Israel or Judah. These are not um, some people out, outside. These are people in the community who have abandoned it and they're following other gods like ba Baal or Baal or uh, Molech or, or others. And, but that's that the conclusion is well the reason why bad things happen is because people didn't obey the law so following the exile following um, the the rebuilding of the temple is chronicled in Ezra and Nehemiah if we're going to have this we're going to have to keep obeying the law that was the Pharisee position so Paul's obsessed with this the law is important if we don't follow the law something worse could happen again perhaps so Paul had become at once the fanatical defender and chaperone of this God and his law and was constantly combating and on the, on the watch for transgressors and doubters, harsh and malicious towards them with the extremest inclination for punishment. So Paul describes himself as a persecutor of, of Christians. Right, early, well, when he's Saul, Shaul, uh, he used to persecute Christians uh, like with, a, with, a, with a pious rage. These Christians are denying Hashem. They're disobeying the law. And you thought of Christians as evil, even. And then he discovered in himself that he himself, fiery, sensual, melancholy, malevolent in hatred as he was, could not fulfill the law. He discovered, indeed, what seemed to him the strangest of all, that his extravagant lust for power was constantly combating and on, on the watch for the transgressors, transgressors and goad. Is it really carnality, which again and again makes him a transgressor? Uh, let me explain that term, carnality. So, <laughs> literally, carne, uh, this is, <laughs> I'm thinking of the Spanish word there, it comes to mind. Meat, all right, like carne asada steak. Um, but it comes from, basically, carnes in Latin means flesh. So sometimes if you read like the King James Bible described, Paul will say like, it's the flesh in me that's bad. And it's not, this is not a, it's not the physicality here. Uh, we're not talking about, some people have read in uh, a Neopl Neoplatonic construction here that what Paul is saying is that, you know, the soul or spirit is good, flesh is bad. The Gnostics certainly like that take too. But what when Paul describes flesh, if memory serves, it's sarx or sar sarxos in the Greek. It, it implies surely a, a, the, the defective part of human nature, not merely the physicality of it, but, uh, but part of a, a diseased uh, non-physical component, or I don't want to say spiritual, but the human personality, like human, human personality is damaged as a result of of sin, but in spite of this, Paul being so pointing that so so very much uh, a critic of others, all right, with a, with a deep hatred of others as a persecutor. Nevertheless, that kind of turns inward at a certain point, and he says, "Oh no, I'm the I'm the chief of sinners. I'm just as bad as the people that I'm uh, persecuting." And he says, and not rather as he later suspected behind the law itself. Uh, and he said, you know, he's saying, Paul says, oh, it's the law. The law is there as an oppressor. Uh, keep in mind that this notion of the law as oppressor is very much a part of 
Lutheran theology too that, that Nietzsche this is a framework that Nietzsche is working with uh, some people would say this is not Paul's take like I could think of um, oh uh, N.T. Wright uh, who is a theologian still alive Anglican who says this is this whole law as oppressor thing and that we're free from the law is not what Paul is saying at all this is called the, the NPP or the new perspective on Paul but Nietzsche is saying here uh, kind of following the Lutheran tradition that, that Paul makes this hard distinction between what, what what the law of God as oppressor, like when it says things like, "Well, don't murder," well, uh, all right, then I'm good. I haven't killed anybody. Ah, but Jesus said, "If you've if you've ever had hatred towards your brother, you've committed murder." Okay, but yeah, I didn't really do it. Yeah, but you thought about it, and if you've ever thought about it, guess what? The wages Paul says the wages of sin is death. It's a very easy transaction. Hmm. I've sinned, even in my even in my head canon, even if I haven't done it in real life. Ergo, I'm supposed to die? Yep, that's the way the law works. Okay, but I haven't done anything. I never committed adultery. I never committed murder. I've never stolen anything. Have you thought about it? Even for a second, entertain the idea? Well, I guess, well, then you deserve to die. That's everyone. And that's the state of sin. Further, Paul will go on. It's not simply that, but there's a sense in which, if you look at Romans 1 and 2, it's not even before you do anything, you're already in a state of sin. Now, Augustine, honestly, <coughs> uh, will have more to say about that. And some people say uh, Augustine invents the concept of original sin, which is the, the transmission of this sinful nature. But I, I think if you look at the, I mean, I'm, I'm not a New Testament scholar, but I think if you look in like the first two chapters of Romans, I think, I think this is a, a Pauline notion and it's not merely Augustinian. But there's that even even if you don't let's say you didn't even think about anything. This is what I'm saying. Paul says some people say Augustine says this later. Um, even even if you didn't like okay no I haven't I haven't even thought about killing someone else. I, I I'm being honest and I'm sincere and I'm and let's assume that I'm actually correct. I haven't really even thought about killing someone else. I haven't thought about stealing. I haven't thought about any of those things. Never even entertained the thought. Let's assume that. Guess what? Well, you still got a sinful nature. Guess what? And even the possession of that sinful nature, uh, the penalty for that is death. And that's, I, I'm getting this from Paul and where he says being in Adam versus being in Christ. Um, so that's not good. <laughs> so uh, what does this law do then? Oh, well, well, guess what? Here's some of the bad things. Enmity, murder, sorcery, idolatry, uncleanliness, drunkenness, and pleasure in debauch. And however much he tried to relieve his conscience and even more his lust for domination through the extremist fanaticism of revering and defending the law, there were moments when he said to himself, it's all in vain. The torture of the unfulfilled law cannot be overcome. It's there. Guess what? Like, no matter how... This is it. This is the, this is the mitzvah. Try as hard as you can. Guess what? You'll never, na you'll never get it. But Paul reaches the conclusion that that's kind of the point. That's the function of the law, to show you these are God's standards. Like when Jesus says, be holy as I am holy. Good luck. You can't. That's why you need Christ's help, which is why you need to be free from the law, Paul will say, in and, and Christianity, I think in general. This is why you need to lean on Christ because you're, 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 not, you're simply not going to do it. It's not, it's not happening. So um, he channels Luther here. Luther may have felt a similar thing when he wanted... Uh, to, uh, in his monastery to become the perfect man of the spiritual idea. So he's saying that Luther also went through a similar kind of episode where uh, whereas Paul was on the road to Damascus <laughs> and has a vision, Luther is on the road I can't remember, somewhere in Germany uh, is caught in a lightning storm and he's like, if you get me through this God, I'll become a monk. And well, he doesn't die in the rainstorm and he becomes a monk and then he's just obs uh, Luther is obsessed with obeying obeying the law and uh, yielding to what he, what he had initially perceived as a very angry God, uh, vindictive God. And later, Luther says, no, it's because we have this misunderstanding of the law. In this case, it's, in, it's, encapsulized, it's encapsulated in his view of what the church is at the time, what, what people will call the, the Catholic Church. That's not quite right. So what happens to Paul? Um, he's now Nietzsche psychologizing here. He's saying, "All right, so Paul is a Pharisee, completely devoted to the letter of the law, like you got to do all it says." Oh no, I can't do what it says. 
And then at last the liberating idea came to him together with a vision as was bound to happen in the case of this epileptic. Maybe he had a vision, kind of an ad hoc scientific explanation here. When someone's having a vision, it's probably an epileptic episode in the ancient world. Uh, to him, this zealot of the law who was inwardly tired to death of it, there appeared on a lonely road Christ with the light of God shining in his countenance. And Paul heard the words, why, persecute, why persecutest thou me? And so Nietzsche's psychologizing here by saying that Paul had realized that uh, what he was doing um, could not be sustained. All his hatred directed outwards to people that were violating the law and saying, oh, well, no, you know, God's going to hate you for this. Uh, so all those people that he was pointing to saying that you're doing the wrong thing, eventually it clicked with, with and again at this time he's Shaul or Saul, it clicked with him that, oh no, I'm just as terrible as all these people I, I'm hating and, you know, having them stoned to death. So then Nietzsche is saying that what Paul does, or what Saul does, is in his own mind has this vision that is made up where he sees Christ uh, and cry, why are you persecuting me? And this is going on in Saul's head. And so what happens here in this episode in the New Testament is that then after a couple of days, you know, he's, he's going to go from being a persecutor to being, you know, a Christian saying, okay, I've had a, I've had a vision from Christ um, that I used to persecute him, and now I, I can't do this anymore. But this is to kind of excuse the fact that he re really what's going on, really what's going on, uh, whether he was consciously intending to do this or not, is that uh, he's making a transition to going, oh, now I'm free from the law. I don't have to obey it anymore. So whether he was kind of just making this up to go, how do I get out of doing this? Or it was something going on underneath, this, underneath the surface where he, he, his... Uh, his sub maybe I'll use a later Freudian concept. His subconscious is trying to get out him out of this. Now, in either case, he gets he gets out, he result the resulting situation is, behold, I uh, I can get I can go past the law. I don't have to obey it anymore to the same degree. Nietzsche continues sick with the most tormented pride. At a stroke, he feels himself recovered. The moral despairs have blown away, destroyed. That is to say, fulfilled. Ah, there, the cross. You know what? Um, I've got this. There's this oppressive law, but you know what? Jesus took care of it. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And if you look at all of Paul's writings, uh, Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, Romans, uh, this is also what I'm about to say is why I don't think Hebrews was written by Paul, even if it was written for uh, more... Jewish audience. I, I don't think it's a Pauline letter because it doesn't follow the following structure. All of Paul's epistles follow this, this structure. The first half is all hear stuff about Jesus that you need to know. And the second half is always therefore do this stuff. But the do this stuff, the second half is never as strict as the the mitzvah or the, the Jewish law. But the first half is always saying these things about Christ. And notice these things about Christ. It's not it, the the Paul's letters rarely use the term just Jesus or Jesus of Nazareth. They're always Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Sometimes the Lord. Okay, In this case, it would be Kurios, not Adonai, not Hashem, um, but Kurios, the Greek word for, for Lord, to refer the lo the Lord Christ. So it would be uh, Kuriai Christos. And he doesn't talk about very rarely does he talk about anything earthly or terrestrial about Jesus. He never says, oh, you remember that time Jesus was in Jerusalem? Or do you remember that time Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Or do you remember that time Jesus grew up in... Find me one example of that. He rarely talks about the biography of Jesus of Nazareth as in a Jesus on earth. He does talk about the crucifixion but he doesn't really talk about it in terms of uh, like it's happenstance, like, oh, he was before Pontius Pilate. I don't think he ever mentions Pontius Pilate. I don't think, um, if memory serves. Like, he never, he doesn't mention any of the, uh, the, fa the, he doesn't talk about any of the kind of the facts that the Gospels do. Now, granted, 
even though they come first in the New Testament, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were actually probably written after Paul's letters. Most historians would conclude. In fact, the, the first books written in the New Testament are probably, I think, I think it's a, uh, simultaneously, 1 Thessalonians and Galatians are the earliest, I think, mid-first century. Some of those Gospels are not written until uh, the end of the first century, almost 50 years later. Uh, to some degree. It's been a while since I've had uh, <laughs> biblical history and literature, but I believe that's the case. Um, confirm that yourself. But so, the point being here, uh, again, what I said there with the, with the text, what were the first New Testament texts? Paul's letters. Um, there was oral transmission, certainly, but really the, the, the textual nature of the New Testament in Christianity centers around Paul's writings. Um, and so now we've got this take that is, yeah, what happened on the cross, it wasn't just that we had this... It was, and, the, and even if we go with the, the take that the, the takes in the Gospels see, were the actual takes of the early first century... Let's just assume that for the sake of argument. There would be some debate on those points and what's going on in the gospel text is actually what historically occurred. This is, again, what you're going to see in theologians like uh, Karl Barth, um, Moltmann, and Boltmann, and Pannenberg, of uh, the distinction between history uh, and Geschichte, as history as, uh, as it occurred in the facts and history in terms of what it means or signifies is that um, even if we say, look, all right, there is this Jewish rabbi who was trying to get back to the basics. Let's just have this take, get back to the basics, whether he claimed to be the son of God uh, or not, or claimed to even be, let's go full Christian theology here, whether he's, he, he was the second person in the Trinity in flesh or not. Nevertheless, even if those things are true, what we see in Paul is giving that crucifixion a kind of metaphysical significance. It wasn't just that he died and rose from the dead. The, the Gospels account this way, like he died and rose from the dead. You don't see in the Gospels them declare, his resurrection therefore means this. There's not really instruction as to what it signifies. It just, other than what Christ says, I, it, maybe the Gospel of John, you could see this more in terms of what the signs signify. The Gospel of John even goes out of its way to say, here's some signs that, that demonstrate this stuff. Uh, and maybe the the uh, the uh, the road to Emmaus stuff in Luke, to some degree, kind of dances about uh, or talks about how uh, really everything was leading to this moment. But what you see in Paul is the the crucifixion and the the whole process here: the, the the crucifixion, death, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ has a significance of what it means that we can we can be saved from the burden of the law. That's really the main part of Paul's, that because we're free in Christ, we don't have to obey all the same kinds of restrictions that we used to. There are still restrictions. And Paul will tell you, like I, like I said, go to the second half of any of Paul's letters, where he makes this transition, you can see it. Uh, but it's different. It's far less strict. Okay, You want to eat, oh, in Judaism, can you eat meat sacrificed to idols? No. For Paul in Corinthians, can you eat meat sacrificed to idols? Maybe not be the best. It might not be the best thing to do, but if you're if you're of good conscience, go for it. But yeah, you can do that. All right, that would be un unthinkable. Um, at least the way Paul describes it, for someone not free in Christ to do. Like, can I eat meat sacrificed to idols? You bet I can, because those idols aren't real, so it doesn't matter. I'm free from I'm free from the law. I'm still, but I'm, I still am supposed to obey the law. The law is still good. But I don't have to worry that if I don't obey it to every single letter, I'm not going to perish because Christ has fulfilled it for me. Uh, that's why I would, I think, th I want to say uh, Second Corinthians, Paul says, He who knew no sin, Christ, became sin so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. Which is to say, Paul has this idea of kind of a transferal. Like what happened on the cross was Christ got all our evil, all our sinfulness, and that was destroyed in the crucifixion. That's what was going on. It wasn't just that he was punished because he was perceived as a degenerate or someone challenging the old system, but the, really what was going on was the plan of God that all of the 
the sin of the people of God would be imputed to Christ and that sin would be destroyed, excised from the universe in the crucifixion. And then through the resurrection, the righteousness of Christ would then be imputed to all his people. Or a more, a more Catholic view would be, it therefore allows for infusion of grace to his people. But the Protestant take here, which the framework Luther, Luther or, I'm sorry, Nietzsche would be working with, would be that what happened is basically a trade. Christ, what he did was he took all the all the sinfulness of his people, and then when he rises from the dead, all his, all his perfect righteousness gets applied. That's, again, so I want to say 2 Corinthians 5. That's Paul's take there. So guess what? Like, I'm supposed to be the law. It's good. But I don't have to worry about being tormented in hell forever because I, I screwed up again. Okay, again, the, the Catholic sacerdotal model of the infusion of grace works a little bit different here, but Nietzsche's not thinking about that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, now the law is abolished in that kind of way. It's been fulfilled. Now, in Lutheranism, this there's a sense in which uh, with, with Luther, there's an even greater sense of liberty. Okay, I'm outside the law. Uh, this is one of the, the criticisms of the... Uh, it, when you see the Council of Trent, where the Catholics basically... The, the Counter-Reformation. The Catholics respond to this by going, they, they just these Protestants, just they don't want to follow the law at all, and it's terrible. Uh, even Calvinists and Anglicans look at the Lutherans and say, you... I mean, this is... Um, this is antinomianism. Antinomianism uh, is the theological position that you should that you're completely against the law uh, entirely, and that's that, that's been considered heretical at various points. It just doesn't matter at all. But Lutherans have been charged with antinomian tendencies since the Protestant Reformation that they're so anti-law that they don't even care, bother following it at all. I'm not saying that's the case, uh, but there is a tendency there surely to go to put oneself at distance with the law and even though this is part of the christian tradition there's a there's a certain german element of this as well where but w what nietzsche is saying here is this is part of the the christian legacy is a the psychological tendency of paul here to how what how can i invent a way to make this easier for me um and there's a sense in which Ni I think even Nietzsche has almost perhaps a an admiration for this. Like, what did Paul do? He got rid of an old ancient morality system by a whim. Now, what he doesn't like about it is that Paul looks like uh, if he, he might have been cunning enough to do it himself, or or he might have been stupid enough for this just kind of for this to have happened to him without really meaning to. But. The problem with this, though, is Paul didn't make this a self-regimen. He then propagated this to others, and this is something that caught on. And so, um, therefore, with that intoxication of Paul, it is at its height, and likewise, the importunity of his soul with the idea of becoming one with, all, one with Christ, all shame, all subordination, all bounds are taken from it, and the <laughs> Oops, and the intractable lust for power reveals itself as an anticipatory reveling in divine glories. This is the first Christian, the inventor of Christianness. Before him, there were only a few Jewish sectarians. So again, there's a there's a, there's an element here in which Nietzsche looks at this and says, Paul is very interesting. Like the fact that he was able to do all this is actually rather impressive but the problem is that this new set got imposed and then Christianity as we know it became this kind of mess where there's the there's these Judaic elements there's these uh, Pauline elements there's maybe a few Jesus elements um, but really you get this mixed bag and it's because of Paul this caught on so much that it became what it is and this is the mess that we're dealing with today. Uh, this is Nietzsche's. This is uh, Nietzsche's take here. And also, in spite of Paul saying that the law is no longer our oppressor, like we don't we don't have to obey any we don't have to obey it in the same way anymore because it's been fulfilled in Christ. 
you might think that that's liberating, and he thinks Paul certainly thought it was. But if anything, it actually becomes, I think Nietzsche is going to show, show this, especially in the Antichrist, if anything, it's actually going to become more oppressive because now, well, since you don't, you know you're not going to be uh, smitten by the Lord, you're not going to get a lightning bolt thrown at you for disobeying something. Nevertheless, you should be doing it because we all know better now. And so, in Christianity, it almost becomes the law, even though we don't have to, f we don't have to follow every jot and tittle. Uh, keep in mind, Jesus himself says, "Not a jot and tittle will pass away." Like even the dots on the I's and the J's are not going to go away. Like the law is still the law always. Jesus said that, but Paul says, "Yeah, but you don't have to obey. It's still there, and it's still there to let you know. Like look up in the law, things basically you can derive principles and figure out what's what's good. So, you know, are, am I supposed to?" you know, follow the same kinds of strictures? Can I not, can I eat meat and dairy now? <laughs> yeah, all right, this is part of, um, this is Peter in the book of Acts, but where Peter sees a vision of all these non-kosher foods and God says, you, 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 can, you can eat it, it's fine. That's, it's not just that, it's also certain other moral things. You don't have to do all the little nooks and crannies of everything, but the issue is, since now you're free from that, you should know better. There's a sense in which uh, having the freedom to not have to do every aspect becomes more oppressive. It becomes more, to be given more freedom is actually more difficult. Um, so th that's, that's, that's where, uh, where Nietzsche is going with this. Now why is, he, why is he doing this? Well he wants to say, well how did, it <laughs> Nietzsche is also trying to diagnose the, the present predicament in the world at the time he's writing, in this case, 1881. And so he's still trying to figure out, like, how did, how did we get here? There's kind of a transcendental question of, uh, of, of Kant. You know, what are the conditions that made this possible? He's certainly not going about it uh, in the same way that Marx did. Well, remember Marx in the German ideology is saying, how did it come to this? Well, we need to understand a complete historical progression of what's going on here. And he's just simply saying, all right, everybody's a Christian here in the 19th century. Why? How did this spread? Bam. Here, here you go. It's because of Paul. And there's some cool stuff in here, but this is where we find ourselves now. This is not great today. And, and if anything, the sclave in morale of today that we have, the, morale, the way that we think about morality, it still comes from this. This is where it comes from, and that's, that's why it needs to be dealt with. All right, continuing on page 196. Oh, we're now in book two of Daybreak. Uh, there's a section on uh, the oldest moral judgments, and so this is going back to his notion of morality and where it came, at least morality as it's construed today, where it came from. He says this, what really, what really are our reactions to the behavior of someone in our presence? First of all, we see that what there is in it for us, we regard it only from this point of view. We take this effect as the intention behind the behavior. Often when we're making moral judgments about someone else did this or someone else did that, we talk about it, it in terms of how is it for us, and that's how we make our evaluations. So even if it's something that doesn't di directly affect us, we do things like what would we do in the situation, how would we like to be treated, uh, but really what we're stating when we make a moral judgment or assessment about something is we are, we are inferring in our own perspective the intention behind the behavior, and th that's how we figure out whether something is good, good or not. And he says, and finally, we ascribe the harboring of such intentions as a permanent quality of the person whose behavior we're observing and thenceforth call him, for instance, a harmful person. Threefold error, threefold primeval blunder. How stupid is it of us to do that? So sometimes we don't do this to ourselves, but to others. If someone does something, someone lies to us, they're a liar. Have we ever told a lie? Well, if we had the same criteria internally, we would be liars too. But we're very critical of others in terms of how it affects us. So that's why he says, you know, if we, if we look at someone's behavior and they're doing something we don't like with them, that's a bad person, just because of maybe one interaction with them. Uh, this often happens with children. Children often have fits. If you're meeting a child for the first time and they're having a fit, you're like, oh, that's that kid, that kid's rough. Um, again, <laughs> Nietzsche just said, that's, that's, that's a mistake, don't do that. He continues, perhaps inherited from the animals and their power of judgment. 
Is the origin of all morality not to be sought in the detestable petty conclusions? What harms me is something evil, harmful in itself. What is useful to me is something good. So that's usually the way we conceive of something. If something's hurtful to me, it's evil to me. This is why um, often if uh, we see this happen in situations where uh, people that we don't like are often vilified, demonized, and people that we do like are often hagiographed. Uh, this happens in every single presidential cycle where someone, say, becoming president. You can go back and look at this for hundreds of years. Uh, for example, right now, people don't like the current president. He's evil. Okay, People that do like him, he's a hero. He's a savior. Regardless of one's opinion on the current president, go back to the previous administration. Exact same phenomenon. Uh, for the people that like him, he's a hero. For people that don't like him, he's evil previous president. You can make this keep going pretty much back until, in the United States, till 1800 at, le at, the, at the latest, because when Thomas Jefferson was running for president, the election of 1800, you can find newspaper pieces where people will say things like, if Thomas Jefferson is elected president, uh, our daughters will be ravaged in the streets, people's heads will be on pikes. I'll see if I can find uh, where that came. I think it's from some Connecticut newspaper in 1799 or 1800. Uh, John Adams wasn't really liked, and George Washington was pretty well regarded. But going back to Thomas Jefferson uh, as president, uh, people don't like him. They're evil because I, I don't like what they represent. They're not a part of my party, and they're considered evil. And if they're on your team, you think you think of it as good. I say that as one example, but there's all kinds of examples where we think of something as having an alterity, it's different from me, it's maybe even harmful to me or the success of my team, there's a hatred. You also see this manifest itself in like sports dynamics where there's, a, there's not just a liking of your team, there's often a hatred of the enemy. Um, so for example, in this part of the country, it might be if one's a Gamecocks fan, they're going to hate the Georgia Bulldogs and the Clemson Tigers. Pick another one of those teams uh, or a really any in the SEC and you're going to find that same kind of animosity somewhere happens in professional leagues. I think there, there may be more people that hate the New England Patriots than actually are fans of the New England Patriots or the New York Yankees or you know the Chicago Cubs. Pick your team. Um, you'll find that to be the case. But the point here is Nietzsche saying this, is that we often think of something as good as something that's good for us. It's useful to me. It's something that I like. Uh, for example, if we like a certain kind of music, well, that's good music, and if we don't like a certain kind of music, just as a matter of taste, we often look at it as, oh, that sucks, it's bad, it's awful, those people aren't musicians. Well, it might not be the kind of music that you like, and therefore you look at it not just as, I don't like it, but it's not, it's not any good. As though you, oneself is the criterion here, in terms of utility used for oneself, and if something is harmful for oneself, is the way we kind of do morality. He's saying that's really what the origin of morality is. We could construe that con collectively. What harms me m once or several times, he continues, is the inimical as such and in itself. What is useful to me um, one or once or several times is the friendly as such and in itself. So there's kind of a habituation that happens here, where if something's good for us several times, we end up really, really liking it. And if something, conversely, is bad several times, we end up uh, making a kind of judgment upon it that it's bad. And he says, oh, pudenda, origo. Uh, oh, the awful origin, or uh, oh, the shameful origin. Does that not mean to imagine that the paltry, occasional, often chance relationship of another with ourself is his essence and most essential being, and to assert that with the whole world and with himself he is capable only of those relationships we have experienced him with him once or several times? And does there not repose behind this veritable folly the most immodest of all secret thoughts, that because good and evil are measured according to our reactions, we ourselves must constitute the principle of the good. So he's saying we really need to come to terms with making what good is for ourselves. Like, like he talked about its origin, but he also talks about how the way that we kind of uh, infer it in a superlative sense as being kind of stupid. So what he's saying is this. If we think of something as good, the reason why we think of it as good is because it's been useful to us. And if it's been useful to us more than once, we embed the concept of goodness within it. Uh, let me give you an example of that uh, in the negative sense. So let's say for until the, the advent of artificial light, um, when night hit, 
human beings lived in the dark. Now, once the electricity hits, this is not an issue today. So you probably, once the sun goes down, you probably have lights on in your house. And even hundreds, years, hundreds of years ago, if the lights went out, you m might have a candle or some kind of lamp in your house. Usually not as many as we have now. You go back far enough, that's not, maybe you'll make a fire, but you go back far enough, this is simply not happening. And there certainly weren't, go back a thousand years ago, there's not, you know, street lights out at night, there's no lit up city life. There's not going to be electric lamps everywhere. And so when darkness hit, and darkness is part of the day, uh, I guess I should say night in this instance, when darkness would hit, you, you, there was, it was really difficult to see. Sometimes that meant you could be preyed upon. You were much less defenseless. You couldn't see what was going on, especially on a moonless night. Uh, so you might be, there's a lot of things about, uh, you know, in a, in a, when there's darkness, you're kind of in a weakened, uh, you're in a more vulnerable state. This is why the concept of darkness is associated with evil. Darkness, can't see, could be under attack. Right? Animals could attack us. Uh, uh, some kind of raiders could attack us. Or some, or maybe pirates, uh, maybe robbers, highwaymen might attack us at night. It's dangerous to travel at night. You don't know what might happen. And so for that habituation of darkness being associated with vulnerability and having to be on the defensive, that's why we use darkness as a being associated with evil. So when you think of like a, a villain in a fantasy, you know, they're often a not, a, not a lord of light, but a dark lord. Okay, well, why is darkness bad? Well, because it's been continually associated by us with this negativity. And what we do is we compound this negativity into a final pronunciation of darkness bad. What's good? Light, of course. Now, I mean, light can be just as harmful. Stare at the sun for a while. Don't. Light can be harmful as well. If you stare at the sun, you will go blind. Uh, if you, too much light can hurt your eyes. You can be blinded by something. Uh, you could even, you know, if you are in the, uh, if you're out in the sun for too long and then you go inside, um, you know, if you've ever done that before, you go from being in the light to being in dark, it's even harder to see, even if you're, the inside of your home is fairly well lit, going inside after being in bright sunlight can be very hard to see. This is actually why uh, pirates wore those eye patches. It wasn't because anyone was missing an eye, it was because they would have one eye that was ready to go in the dark and one eye that was ready to go in light, and so if they went below deck, the 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 eye that was already uh, you know ready for darkness, pupils big and ready to go. You just switch the eye patch. Now you're ready to go into a different environment. Um, that's just for free. But what Nietzsche is saying in here is because of these associations, <coughs> what we actually need to recognize is not that. <coughs> excuse me. The things that we think of as evil are evil in themselves, or the things that we think of as good are good in themselves. It's that we associate that based on our experiences collectively as human beings. And that's been the case. So let me move on to the next section here. Um, this he says, he's talking about the denial of morality. So what does it mean to deny uh, morality? He says, first of all, it can mean to deny that the moral motives which men claim to have inspired their actions really have done so. So uh, when people claim that I'm doing this for this reason, do they really do so? That's one thing. Um, then it can mean to deny that moral judgments are based on truths. That's really the more important one for Nietzsche. So we can certainly make claims like uh, murder is bad or that one ought not to steal or someone should be punished for doing this. Those are all moral judgments. Nietzsche's not denying that. He's denying that they're based on some kind of pre-existent truth that determines their, their, that the morality is grounded in the notion of veracity or truth. So he says, sure, like pe people really believe that. He doesn't deny that. He has admitted that they really are motives of action, but that in this way, it is errors which, as the basis of all mor moral judgment, impel men to their moral actions. This is my point of view. Here it is. Though I should be the last to deny it, that in very many cases there is some ground for suspicion that there are other points of view. Um, like uh, La Rochefoucauld, La Rochefoucauld and others who think like him may also be justified in any event of great application. Here he gets to the point. Thus I deny morality as I deny alchemy. That is, I deny their premises. 
but I do not deny that there have been alchemists who believed in these premises and acted in accordance with them. I also deny immorality. Not that countless people feel themselves to be immoral, uh, immoral but that there, but there is any, but there is any true reason so to feel. So he's saying here that sure, um, people have acted in accordance with certain moral values. He's not denying that people have done that, that people are trying to act in accordance with morality. He's also going to say um, this, which I think most people would not associate with Nietzsche, but he says this. Um, it goes without saying that I do not deny, unless I'm a fool, that many actions called immoral ought to be avoided and resisted, or that many called moral ought to be done and encouraged. So here he's saying, yeah, a lot of things that people say are good, yeah, people should do those things. It, 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 that's fine. And there are things that you shouldn't do. Nietzsche says, I completely agree with you. There are things that shouldn't be done. There are things that should be done. And we might, if Nietzsche's talking to you, he might even agree with you that we agree on the same stuff. There's things we should do and shouldn't do. But to ground it on a notion of capital T truth is what's the problem here. Um, going back to this point, he denies immorality, not that countless people feel themselves to be immoral, but that there is any true reason so to feel. So again, to sum up what he's saying here, there's things that maybe we should or shouldn't do, but don't try and ground it in a notion of truth, as though it is self-evident from the beginning of time that here are the things that ought to be done and ought not to be done, and it's just there embedded in nature as true as something obvious uh, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is something that Immanuel Kant tried to do in his moral philosophy, where remember uh, Kant said that there are synthetic a priori uh, propositions that are knowable, that is things that are true by definition but known uh, that are, I'm sorry, not true by definition but are known prior to experience. And so for him it would include especially mathematical like U Euclidean geometric judgments like you can uh, like I've said this before you can picture in your mind if I told you to picture a cube in your head and I asked you how many edges does it have you could go you know after doing some counting you know all right it's got uh, 12 edges and but you could know that in your head without knowing it it wouldn't necessarily be immediately uh, cognized you wouldn't have that number necessarily at the ready but you could do it in your head like it's already because all the information is already there pre-given in your mind or your mind is already constructed in that way uh, that's math uh, it has that thing that Descartes thought of being clear and distinct ideas in the philosophy of Descartes where he, he Descartes really likes mathematics because at least the mathematics that he's dealing with because it's got clear and distinct ideas triangle has three sides you can't really argue that point unless you want to change what the terms mean but when you come to morality, like how many sides does a triangle have? Three. Like, no one's going to question you on this. Is capital punishment right or good? That's a different kind of question, it seems. Well, not for the, in the philosophy of Kant, because Kant said, ah, moral judgments are just as knowable through the praktischen Vernunft or the practical reason, just as geometric knowledge is knowable uh, a priori through pure reason or reinen Vernunft. Uh, that's, that's something that we can do. Nietzsche is simply denying that claim. Like with this, morality isn't math. There are not simple uh, deductions that you can make. Maybe if you establish certain principles, you can base. Yeah, Nietzsche says if you base, if you take certain principles at the forefront and presuppose on those, sure. But to say that your axioms in place are already ready to go and, and grounded, not so much. So before that reason, he says. We have to learn how to think differently in order at last, perhaps very late on, to attain even more, to feel differently. The way that we've been doing morality is antiquated. And it's also, uh, it's just a whole discombobulated process. It's just not working. It doesn't work. It's kind of worn out. We don't realize that the stuff, the moral decisions that we make, it's not based on truth. It's really based on a kind of feeling. So we need to teach ourselves to really feel differently. Another problem with language in the next section is the notion of the so-called ego. Now, I think the translation of ego here out of the German, the German is uh, the like, like in Fichte, the, the das Ich, the, the I, the self. I, like capital I. Um, 
I think the translation of das Ich as ego is for whatever reason following the translation of Freud into English. Well, you, you might remember Freud has the notion of the ego, the das Ich, the id, the das S, and the superego in the German, uh, the, I think it's das über Ich, okay, the over I. Uh, for whatever reason, whatever reason in English these get translated as uh, Latin phrases of the ego, the id, and the superego. I couldn't tell you why, but it seems like it's following that translation for some reason. But here, talking about the notion of the self, listen to what he says here about talking about ourselves, morality, and the notion of language. Is language adequate to express really anything? Uh, and this is part of a 19th century critique that's already kind of crept up uh, through uh, some other German thinkers that are before, like uh, like Lessing. You see this? We see this a little bit in Lessing uh, and a few other German thinkers before, where maybe maybe language is not as well equipped as we would like. We also definitely going to see this in the 20th century, both in analytic and continental philosophy of languages not doing is it's, it's an amazing thing okay in fact it's preposterous just how we're able to communicate you know, even if you read somebody like Chomsky but uh, language is not as equipped to transmit uh, our ideas as we might think there's still a bit of a gap so listen to what he says here language and the prejudices upon which language is based are a manifold hindrance to us when we want to explain inner processes and drives because of the fact, for example, that words really exist only for superlative degrees of these processes and drives. So we have, well, there's stuff that we do uh, every day. And what we, what we end up doing is we end up using words which we really, really only refer to, especially when it's, when it's actions. We're describing what we're doing. Uh, what kind of actions? Well, consider these words that he says down here. Anger, hatred, love, pity, desire, knowledge, joy, pain. Let's take love, for example. Now, you might say, like in a heated moment of passion, in, let's say romantic passion, you might say, I love you, and mean it earnestly and just be overwhelmed by this feeling of <laughs> what Schleiermacher might call absolute concern. Um, just, just overwhelming sense of absolute passion. I love you so much. Uh, and then on the same, at the same time, maybe even on the same day, you might be eating a meal, say like it's your favorite food, and you go, I love this. Or, or you might even say in passing, like, oh, I love that. And the word is correct, but there's the, the comparison in terms of the intensity of the, of the feeling is th nowhere near equivalent. Same thing with the others. You might think, of, you know, some things you can be, <sighs> something disappointing happened to you today, you say, you oh. know, yeah, I'm pretty. I'm I'm kind of angry about it. But then you might be, someone did something grossly unjust to you, and you're filled with anger. Maybe not necessarily hatred, but anger. Those two things are distinct. Uh, the anger is incomparable from each other. They're so far removed. Like being angry over a little thing and being a angry over something substantive. But really, the word anger seems to imply the maximal amount, as though it's all there. This is a problem with language. So when we talk about hatred, hating something, you can hate something a little bit or a lot. But it seems like when we invoke these terms, it, we're invoking the full-fledged meaning of all these kinds of terms. Anger, hatred, love, pity, desire, knowledge, joy, pain. Like joy. Joy is a maximal where it means to be completely, almost, you know, abundant and exuberant in happiness. Okay? But you might say, you know, I'm just filled with joy that this, you know, I saw the sunshine today or something like that. Well, but that joy might not be comparable to another experience that you have where you're feeling, <coughs> you are feeling that maximal sense of joy. That's why he says uh, that these words only exist for superlative degrees. And <coughs> when we don't have words of say uh, that are lacking, we don't have gradation, um, we are accustomed to abandon exact observation because exact thinking there becomes painful because we don't have different grades or gradients of anger, hatred, love, pity, desire, knowledge, joy, pain, it's, and, and others. And so we either say the big one or go, eh, whatever. And... <laughs> <laughs> That's why he says in earlier times one involuntary concluded, involuntarily concluded that where the realm of words ceased, the realm of existence ceased also. If you don't have the words, um, <laughs> it's, it's hard to express. If you don't have the words, you can't really express something. So there's those terms, all these maximal terms, extreme states, extreme states. The milder middle degrees, not to speak of the lower degrees, which are continually in play, elude us. So what does it mean to be a little angry? 
I'm just kind of mad. Miffed. It's kind of hard to describe it. Like when we see these words, when we see just anger by itself, or hatred by itself, or love by itself, we think of it in maximal terms. It's kind of hard for us to think of a downgraded version of it. Um, it eludes us. And yet it is, we experience the lower degrees of these concepts more than we do the extreme versions. Like we don't have the anger, hatred, love, pity in their maximal forms on a day-to-day -day basis. We have their milder forms. Uh, look at that. Oh, yeah. I, I love this. I learned something today. Okay, pretty happy about that. I stubbed my toe. Okay, different than having, say, you know, breaking your femur bone. That's not something that happens every day. I want, you know, I, you know what? I want something. You know, I'm kind of, I think I'm kind of hungry versus I haven't eaten in a month. Those are different states of affairs. But, and so the milder versions are what we actually encounter off to, most of the time and really make ourselves out of, okay? We web our character and our destiny. It's those little states that make us who we are. It's really how we define our personality of who we are of these little versions. When we talk about someone being an angry person, you know, well, one, how to, intense does it get? And two, how, how often do you have, are you mildly angry all the time? Slow burn? Yeah, you might be an angry person. But these extreme outbursts, on the other hand, and even the most moderate conscious pleasure or displeasure while eating food or hearing a note, is perhaps rightly understood an extreme outburst. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes you are eating something and you really are like, oh, this is the best thing I've ever had. Excuse me. Or you hear music and you just think, oh, this is absolutely beautiful. Rare occurrences. Rare occurrences entirely. And yet we constitute ourselves uh, out of these little experiences, but we only have the vocabulary of the big experiences, and that kind of throws, of us, throws us off. And that's why he says here, and this will be echoed when we get to the opening of the genealogy of morality, he says, we are none of us that which we appear to be in accordance with the states for which we alone have consciousness and words and consequently praise and blame. Now let's slow that down because I think, I think Freud actually is going to do, uh, Freud ended up at some point, I don't know if he read it all, but I know he had collected works of Nietzsche and he at least looked at them as a kind of an influence, even though we don't see him explicitly mentioned in Freud's writings, but this here, uh, let me focus on this to, st to start. We are none of us that which we appear to be in accordance with the states which alone we have consciousness and words. You think, I'll say this here at the start, you, we think we know ourselves. You think you know you, I think I know myself. And we kind of think of ourselves as the expert on ourselves. How could anyone know us better than ourselves? I know me better than you do, surely. And you think you know yourself better than I do or someone else might. And Nietzsche is throwing a little bit of skepticism onto that because we are not just that which we're conscious of. There's so much that we're not paying attention to around us. And also, we're not paying attention to all that within us and unto ourselves. This is why sometimes when you might receive an evaluation, like in a work context or even from friends, like, hey, you're, you're really being kind of mean here. And you just think of yourself as, I'm not mean at all or I'm not rude, or I didn't do this, or I can't believe I came across that way. How could there be a disconnect? Well, because you don't know you as well as you think you do. And you're not just merely the, your con what you're immediately aware of, because the way consciousness works too, sure, we're all conscious while we're awake. I can see all the stuff going on around me. But one of the things about a, a kind of directed consciousness that we have is we can have particular foci. Like I can be looking at this thing, or I can look at that thing, or I can look at the camera right now, and I'm immediately aware of the camera right now. But, you know, if I look at it now, I'm mentally aware of the camera, even though I'm not observing it. And then later I might be looking straight at the camera, but really not be thinking about it. And we're not merely, we are not reducible to these conscious states and the words that we say. And not, and it's not reducible to that. In fact, those cruder outbursts of which we alone are aware make us understand ourselves. Like, we, when we do the, the big ones, we really know what we like. Like when we, when we have one of those amazing moments, okay, like something that brings us pure joy or pure pleasure or pure, I'm hesitant to say happiness, those things, like those things we remember, those are our most cherished memories. But we also have the outbursts of pain 
anger, hatred, and whether that was something that happened to us or something that we did, I shouldn't have gotten that angry. I shouldn't have hated those people for whatever reason. We remember those aspects of ourselves as well, and those are the aspects of praise and blame, respectively. But we draw a conclusion on the basis of data in which the exceptions outweigh the rule. So you might think of something, oh, I got angry 20 years ago, well, it's, and I, sh I did something I should have done. It's been 20 years, and you're not like that every day. I was then. This is now. We take, and we, we do this with ourselves, we take, for good and for ill, we take instances of ourselves, snapshots, and we make the snapshots into a tapestry. We take a moment of our lives and we flatten out that moment and stretch it out um, in a way that doesn't work. To, to quote uh, the Fellowship of the Ring, it's like butter scraped over too much bread. It just, it, 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 when you try and spread this out, it's not going to cover the totality of one's life. Now, sometimes we do this. Someone did something at a certain point in life, we say that that's who they are. They are reducible to this particular moment in their lives. If it was a good thing, they're reducible to that moment. More often, if it was a bad thing, they're reducible to that moment, something that somebody did. Someone's, say someone's in, uh, uh, got life in prison for murder when they were 17. They're 99 years old. Uh, they're still a murderer. This terrible thing they did most of their life was after that, be being in prison, but now this moment where we're going to continually indict this person for this thing they did. I'm not saying that's good or bad uh, at this point. I'm simply just saying that's what we do. Or we say, you know what? Uh, we do this often with political figures. You know, yeah, this person did a lot of bad things. Uh, but you know what? They did this one good thing here. And so that's got to be commended. Might be early in life, it might be later. Okay? Um, to I'm trying to think of a good example of, uh, of that one where someone's uh, points back to one good moment in, at the expense of being bad and uh, I mean I guess you could say that with various uh, especially military commanders where you know they might have been violent individuals capable of crimes but you know what they did something good here they showed mercy here and so they need to be remembered for this mo I could, uh, fictional character Darth Vader genocidal maniac working I know fictional character genocidal maniac uh, ruthlessly slaughtering people uh, guilty of war crimes but you know what he, he became a good guy back at the end remember and uh, it's though that one moment of goodness somehow stretches or covers over all the evil that one had done so what we need to do then uh, when we when we we need to stop misreading ourselves and he says this, our opinion of ourself, however, which we have arrived at by this erroneous path, the so-called e ego, the self that we think we're constructing, is thenceforth a fellow worker in the construction of our character and destiny. So even the version of ourselves that we think if we have in our heads, is just that it's a version that's part of the overall constitution of our actual selves. Okay, next. So now let's take a look at this next section where um, Nietzsche, this is again on page 198, starts talking about experience and invention. And he's still talking about our self-knowledge. He says, however far, however far a man may go in self-knowledge, nothing, however, can be more incomplete than his image of the totality of drives which constitute his being. He can scarcely name even the cruder ones, their number and their strength, their ebb and their flood, their play and counterplay among one another, and above all, the laws of their nutriment remain wholly unknown to him. That is, um, we have all these drives, all these desires. This is something he's definitely channeling from Schopenhauer. Uh, we've got this uh, villa, right? The, these drives and desires, which we're really not good at art articulating or even really being self-conscious of. We have them, they're there, but we we sometimes we sate them but we don't really don't know what's guiding our drives and desires as Schopenhauer said you know you can sometimes you can want what you want but you can't stop the wanting that you have so uh, we're not even really introspective enough to realizing what's going on behind us this is why 
the disciplines of psychi psychiatry, psychology, and psychoanal psychoanalysis, which is the Freudian take, exists. So again, I think there's a little bit in here that reminds me of things that we'll see in Freud. What's going on behind the scenes in our desires? Nietzsche doesn't really, he's saying that we don't really know that, but he says, um, there, for, imagine if it were analogous to this. Imagine if our drives were analogous to this one. Here's a drive that you know. He says, perhaps this cruelty pep perpetrated by chance will be more vividly evident if all the drives were as much in earnest as his hunger, which is not content with dream food, but most of the drives, especially the so-called moral ones, do precisely this. If my supposition is allowed that the meaning and value of our dreams is precisely to compensate to some extent for the chance absence of nourishment during the day. Again, it seems like Freud is doing a lot with this when we get to Freud. Why was the dream of yesterday full of tenderness and tears, that of the day before yesterday humorous and exuberant, an earlier dream adventurous and involved in a continuous gloomy searching? What Nietzsche is saying here is that when it comes to hunger, hunger is a drive which we all experience where it's very obvious that what we want to do is to be sated. That is, we know what we want, we want to eat. We might necessarily, <laughs> you might find yourself in this situation uh, deciding what to eat. Do I want to go here? Do I want to get this food? Do I want to do this? Do I want to make this for dinner? Sure, you've got that, but you know what you want to do is when, when you've got that experience of I'm hungry, you want to eat, and you're probably going to eat. It's pretty straightforward. Our other drives are not as straightforward. And this actually reminds me of something, this might be surprising, but it reminds me of something C.S. Lewis said in a book called Mere Christianity. Uh, there's a section in this book where he's talking about uh, sexuality. He's talking about sexual desire. And he says, can you imagine if we treated, like, sexual desire is really confusing. Again, Freud will do a lot with this, too. But C.S. Lewis imagines this. Can you imagine, you know, one of the things that people do is they'll tantalize themselves sexually. And C.S. Lewis gives the example of what he calls the striptease. Like, like watching someone uh, strip out of their clothing to kind of stimulate us sexually. But he says, you know, it doesn't lead to the ultimate, you know, in this situation, it doesn't lead to the ultimate sexual gratification or something orgasmic. It's just uh, we kind of tantalize, like we, we tantalize that sexual desire. We get ourselves excited, but we don't necessarily fulfill that desire. There's something weird going on there. C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity, can you imagine if we did this with food? Like imagine you bring out something delicious to the table and slowly lift the lid off it <laughs> and try and be sultry about it. Oh, oh no. Just peeking. Look, don't touch. Look, don't eat. Can you imagine if we did that with food? Now, sometimes in imagery of food, where we're looking at ad commercials or magazines or something like that, that makes sense to me. But still, if you're looking at food, it's probably because you want to eat it. You're not merely going to subsist on the uh, tantalizing of images of food. You're eventually going to eat something. Um, that's why I'm, I'm. Sometimes I've seen, you know. In recent years, people will take pictures of what they're eating and post it on Instagram, and it's even been referred to as food porn. Sure, that's fine, I, I suppose, but it's peculiar. So C.S. Lewis said, we, we, can you imagine if we did that? We kind of do that today. But even there still, you might look at imagery of something, but you're probably going to eat something later today. Whereas you might be involved in a whole host of sexual fantasies where one's sex life is not actually fulfilled in any kind of meaningful or even physical way. What he's saying here also is that perhaps what the way dreams work is that our dreams, he doesn't use the concept of subconscious because Freud is going to invent that, but perhaps there's something going on where our dreams compensate. Look, he says this right here, our dreams, the meaning and value of our dreams is precisely to compensate to some extent for the cha chance absence of nourishment, that is whatever we want, the fulfillment of desires during the day. So let's say we have our drives and desires, things that we want. Some of the things that we dream about is to make up for the things that we want that we didn't get. And um, I think this is anticipatory of Freud, and I wanted to go ahead and point this out here. Again, Freud makes no direct reference to it, but he does talk about it. Uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of Freud's work, especially his early work on dreams, I guess I should say his, his early middle work, on dreams is very much evocative of this. Okay. Let's take a look at this next entry. Now I'm on page 200. Here, 
this is something that we do I'm talking about teleology and desire purposes and will uh, consider this he says we have accustomed ourselves to believe in the existence of two realms the realm of purposes and will and the realm of chance in the latter everything happens senselessly things come to pass without anyone being able to say why or wherefore we stand in fear of this mighty realm of the great cosmic stupidity for in most cases we experience it only when it falls like a slate from <laughs> from the roof onto that other world of purposes and intentions and strikes some tre treasured purpose of ours dead so we tend to he's uh, saying here we tend to make a a binary dynamic in the world of things that are in our control and things that are out of our control uh, i think this reminds me of the beginning of epictetus's and in our handbook where he says some things are up to us some things are not up to us. That's the stoic attitude. There's the orderly, and the orderly is that which I do. And there's the chaotic, which is just the kind of the universe out there. That's not a stoic take. In fact, for the stoics, the, the universe, is the logos, there's kind of an orderly, orderliness to it. But at least in the modern world, even, even in our uh, sort of modern understanding today, we'll, we'll talk about postmodernism later, but in our modernistic understanding, there's kind of, there's our purpose, there's what things are for, and our desires, and these things that we're conscious of. These are what things are for. It could include, like I said, teleology, what, what, what things are for. Knowing that, um, you know, like oxygen is for breathing, that doesn't mean it was designed for that reason. That might be a, a pre-modern or classical approach. But knowing what things are for, that would be the notion of purpose and will what I desire. We can also think of purpose in the sense of vocation. What am I supposed to do? I'm meant for this. And I, I like maybe I want to do something with my life. I have a desire for it. I think I'm meant for this. And then, you know, I'm applying for grad school and then something happens and I can't follow through with it. That can fall in the realm of chance. Many of us right now in this time where the reason why we're doing a video instead of meeting in person is because of that chaotic notion of chance. Like there were, maybe there were things that could have been organized in response to the present situation. Maybe, maybe not. But regardless of that, where we find ourselves here is in the domain of the chaotic chance. And we tend to say, the chance out, this, this is good, we tend to think, and this chance is bad. Happenstance, and we like, when good things happen to us by chance, we like it. And more often than not, chance is the domain of <laughs> disappointment. Well, um, he gives some examples throughout history um, of different civilizations responding to this phenomenon. Uh, he says the Greeks, for example, called this realm of the incalculable, of sublime, eternal narrow-mindedness, Moira. There's that. The Scandinavians had the uh, twilight of the gods. And thus, uh, so there's this notion in Norse mythology of the uh, the twilight of the gods uh, that, that enjoys a silent revenge and in, in retaliation for the continual fear uh, his evil gods uh, that should be, I think, produce in him. Uh, then we've got this, Christianity, whose basic feeling is neither Indian nor Persian, not Greek nor Scandinavian, acted differently. It bade us to worship the spirit of power in the dust and even to kiss the dust itself. The sense of this being, that the, that the, that the almighty realm of stupidity was not as stupid as it looked that it was we, rather, who were stupid in failing to see that behind it there stood our dear God, who, though his ways were dark, strange and crooked, would in the end bring it all, bring all to glory. And he says here after this, so ancient interpretations of this are when something chaotic or bad happened, uh, you know, the gods, are, the gods are being vengeful, they're disappointed in us, things that are, were out of our control. I mean, I mentioned earlier about uh, the view on the probably when most of the Hebrew texts or many of the Hebrew texts were written that were part of the Hebrew Bible or what would be considered the Old Testament were written after the exile uh, looking back saying here's why these things happened here's the explanation and we kind of do this when disaster strikes we look back at how, how could this have happened and we, and we trace it back oh, we should have known better well the ancient views were, were again some there might there must be some God is angry with us or there must be some kind of evil entity that's wreaking havoc on us and that's what's responsible for it but he says where Christianity is different so Christianity it's not uh, 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 it looks bad 
but actually it is good because God is going to bring all to glory. Okay, I can, you can think of examples for this where you know you, the, the, the subtle phrase, God works in mysterious ways. It might seem bad right now, but he works all things together for the good of those who are in Christ Jesus. That would be a Christian take, for example. Everything's going to work out in the end. Uh, this is also the Christian take on the book of Job. Uh, Job is considered a poetic book in, that is, it's not taken as scripture in the same sense. It's part of the Tanakh, but it's not part of the Torah um, in the Jewish or Hebraic sense. But in the Christian sense, it's, it's considered scripture. What happens to Job? All these, <laughs> literally in the story, Satan goes to God in Job chapters 1 and 2 and says, hey, there's a guy named Job on earth. Let me ruin his life. Let me kill his children, torture him, make his house burn down. He loses all his money. It'll be, and he'll curse you to your face, God. And God says, go for it. I'm not making this up. Go, go read Job chapters 1 and 2. And so all these terrible things happen to Job, and his friends come up to him and go, like, dude, what did, what did you do to screw this up? Like, God's punishing you for something. And even his wife says to him, you know, Job has these terrible boils on his skin, and he's taking, like, shattered pieces of clay pots to, to scratch the boils on his skin, and it's nasty. And his wife says to him, curse God and die. And he says, uh... <laughs> Der Herr got nipped, der Herr got gipped. That's in German, um, written in Hebrew. But that's the Lord giveth, Hashem gives, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Job's take is, I don't know what's going on here, but praise God. He's working it out somehow, and that's what like, God shows up in the end. Not, not visibly, but starts talking to Job and his friends, and is like, look, I'm doing this because I'm awesome. I'm God. So this whole conversation that we're having is for my glory. Everything's for my glory. I'm doing this to make me look good because I'm God. Worship me. You weren't there when I created the heavens, were you? The Orion, the Pleiades, were you there? I don't think so. But I was because I'm God. And so even when bad things happen, it works for the glory of God. So even Christian takes on, you know, did, was Judas always destined to betray Jesus and then to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver well if the, if the prophecies are true then yeah that was always destined to happen he didn't really have a choice in the matter and so this comes into play when we're talking about notions of especially free will versus um, versus um, you know things happening that are outside of our control are, are do we are we freely able to choose what's going on or is there simply uh, chaos out there and happenstance and Nietzsche is at least saying here the way that we usually interpret it is like even when even when things are in the realm of chance well in Christianity not so much things are just going on God works in mysterious ways we don't know exactly what's happening but he's the one directing it all all things for the glory uh, for his own glory and therefore um, whereas in the past, people used to say, when he, when he says the word stupidity here, by the way, he doesn't mean that God is stupid. He's saying stupidity in the sense of, like, there's not a knowing agent out there. or there's, there's a, It's not as though there's something necessarily willing this to happen. When he's talking about the past, but, or at least pre-Christian societies. When he talks about Christianity, he's saying, uh, uh this stupidity actually has a purpose. This realm of stupidity, things just kind of happening. No, 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 things don't just happen. God's behind everything. He goes further by saying this new fable of a loving God who had hitherto been mistaken for a race of giants or from Moira or, and who himself span out purposes and nets more refined even than those produced by our own understanding too lofty for me so that they had to seem incomprehensible, indeed unreasonable to it this fable represented so bold an inversion and so daring a paradox that the ancient world, grown over refined, could not resist it no matter how mad and how contradictory the thing might sound or between ourselves there was a contradiction in it if our understanding cannot divine the understanding and the purposes of God whence did whence did it divine this quality that's divine as a verb there this quality of its understanding and this quality of God's understanding so here what he's saying is you know if, it, if we're looking at something happening and we can't figure it out then it's not, it's, not the, it's not God that's the problem. It's not that his problem that he hasn't revealed to us why he's doing certain things. But it's that we just, we just don't know what it is. So we're the ones at fault here. 
he's saying that's a new phenomenon that you really only get uh, with Christianity and not exactly a fan of this take here that is Nietzsche is not a fan of that Christian take obviously just leaving it to oh well you know there's got to be it might look bad there's a reason for everything is there this is what Nietzsche said. is there a reason for everything must something come to pass saying that's the way that we're interpreting things and maybe we need to look at it differently and again the whole theme of this work is we need to change the way that we're looking at things change the way also that we feel about things he doesn't Nietzsche doesn't always give us a, a prescription as to what exactly that entails just yet but that's the view that he's maintaining in this work daybreak um, transitioning here to now the next page 201 he does a little bit of a mention of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau Swiss uh, philosopher and political theorist that it's a little bit of an aside but I want to I want to talk about it for a second so Rousseau begins his book Emile by saying that you know man is born free but everywhere he's in chains what's what's wrong with our world today is society so sometimes there's a view um, in reactionary conservatism conservatism that there's some point in the past we want to go back to that golden age like ah, like I said before often uh, often ca some Catholic takes are that you know where society started going downhill that brings us to the world that we have today it's Protestantism as soon as that started it fractured Europe it fractured the West it fractured the church and that fragmentation uh, has uh, continued to this day and that's what leads to so many of our modern social ills uh, that's a that's a diagnosis and interpretation of things that have happened in time and history. Um, that's one view that things have gotten worse over time because we need to get back to our better society. There's also a, a progressive view that as we advance and as we gain more, as society gets more urbanized and we have we become more technologized and. We have better communication, information, medical technology. The things will get better and better and better and better and better and better. It'll be awesome. So you have that kind of conservatism, sometimes might be called like a regressivism. Let's go back. Then you got progressivism. As we go to the future, things are going to get better and better and better as society advances more and more and more and more. Rousseau had a take on the other hand. Actually, what's corrupting us today, and, and he was writing this in like the 18th century, it's society itself. Society itself is messing us up. We need to go back to being kind of noble savages okay uh, similar to Locke and uh, Hobbes to some extent but not entirely well here's Nietzsche's response to that contra Rousseau if it is true that our civilization is something pitiable about it oh, to the society today you have the choice of concluding with Rousseau that this pitiable civilization is to blame for our bad morality the reason why we have bad morals today is because of the society that we have but he says or you could decide against Rousseau that our good morality, our notion of good, is to blame for this for the pitiableness of our civilization. So he, what he's saying here is Rousseau says our oh, society has made our morals decay. Um, Nietzsche's saying, on the other hand, maybe morality, the morality that we have that we've inherited, is making our that's making our society decay. On the other hand, <coughs> excuse me, our weak unmanly social concepts of good and evil and their tremendous ascendancy over body and soul have finally weakened all bodies and souls and snapped the self-reliant independent unprejudiced men the pillars of a strong civilization where one still encounters bad morality one beholds the last ruins of these pillars and thus paradox stands against the paradox uh, the truth cannot be possibly on both sides and is, is it on either of them go test it out so again we have two antithetical theses there that of Rousseau that what's made morality decay is the existence of our modern society whereas Nietzsche is saying let's at least test <laughs> he's asking the question what if the opposite were true Nietzsche surprisingly Hegelian there um, see if the opposite is true is it that is it true that it's society that's making morality decay or is it our concepts of morality that are making society decay? And he says, check it out <laughs> for yourself. Or like reading Rainbow, you don't have to take my word for it. Go check it out. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, let's do a little bit of this on grand politics. I'm going to look at the beginning and a little bit of the end. He's starting to develop a notion here, I think, of the Villes <coughs> uh, or the will to power, uh, when talking about politics. So listen to what he says about politics here, uh, how to govern. However much utility and vanity those of individuals as of peoples may play in part in grand politics. So we're not talking about people running for mayor, but how should we organize society? No, we're not just talking about you know doing daily stuff like daily administration, that kind of thing. The strongest tie which carries them forward is the need for the feeling of power, which from time to time streams up out of inexhaustible wells, not only in the souls of princes and the powerful, but not least in the lower orders of people. So people do this. Why do people want to be in charge? Right there. Why does anyone run for president? What do kings do? They like this feeling of power. It's intoxicating. Nietzsche's not necessarily saying this is a bad thing at this point. You, you know, well, and that would be something that Nietzsche wouldn't say. But it is driven by, the politics is driven by the need for the feeling of power. It doesn't matter the political party. It really doesn't matter the, the kind of dynamic, whether you've got an oligarchy, an aristocracy, a democracy, a republic, a dictatorship, uh, a vanguard of the proletariat. In every, and in each case, what's undergirding uh, people wanting to come to power is just the need for the feeling of power. People like the feeling of power. They like being in charge. And Nietzsche is going to develop this later into even many mundane situations where often what we do when we're asserting ourselves really anywhere is we like the feeling of power that we have when we're on top of the situation. We like that, that feeling of dominance. Now he says a little bit further down um, let's take a look at this. Uh, the great conquerors have always mouthed the pathetic language of virtue. So whether you look at Julius Caesar or Napoleon Bonaparte, I'm not sure I'd put uh, uh, to Chinggis or Genghis Khan in this category. No, I, certainly, I think he's the <laughs> the greatest of those conquerors, but I I can't, I can't recall where he is about where we can see him espousing virtue in this way. But take the example of Julius Caesar and Napoleon. The great conquerors have always mouthed the pathetic language of virtue. I'm doing something good. And here's what goodness is. They'll make, they'll make some talk about it. How, they have, the, have had around the masses in a condition of elevation who wanted to hear only the most elevated language. So they say this stuff because people want to hear it. But this is what good leaders do in this feeling of power. They say things that people want to hear. Keep going. Strange madness of moral judgments. Now consider this, this is the part that's important in this passage. When man possesses the feeling of power, he feels and calls himself good. And it is precisely then that the others upon whom he has to discharge his power feel and call him evil. This is similar to what I was saying earlier when we're talking about especially political affiliation, it might be elsewhere. People that we like are good, if we're in accordance with them, and we think of people that support us as good, and we think of those, especially those who feel who has to discharge his power. Either they've lost power or they're because they're no longer in power anymore, like a, a, an administration losing, especially like an incumbent losing a re-election. Uh, but also it might be the diminishment of power. Those people are perceived as enemies. And those people are going to call him evil and he's going to call he's going to call them evil too. But when people are displaced from power, they think of it as bad. Okay, even, maybe even if it was warned. I mean, you, you see this uh, in all kinds of. Oft, often, it's the you could say the victors of history, or the writers of history, but you see this as, you know, say like um, when you're looking at a history of the French Revolution, from say an aristocratic perspective. Like, can you believe how these poor nobles were killed by these evil peasants? But if you were to read, um, you know, a people's history of the French Revolution, you'd be reading about the evil aristocracy. Uh, oppressing the peasantry prior to the revolution. So Nietzsche is already getting here at a notion of a hermeneutical context of interpretation when we're looking at notions of good and evil. Often uh, no one sees themselves, and this goes back to actually surprisingly something Socrates said, no one willing, Socrates said that no one willingly does evil. That is everyone in their head is the good guy. 
I think this is a feature both of history and of fiction that you know most of the villains are heroes in their own story to use another pop culture example uh, say the recent Marvel films you've got Thanos the villain who's going to you know when if he can get all those gems together in that gauntlet make that snap it wipes out half of the population of the universe that's bad but in his head he's doing it for a good reason we do this then there's not overpopulation there's not starvation there will be more resources available for everyone this is a good thing in his own head it's a good thing um, it's not just like uh, you know a more fantastical villain would be somebody like Sauron in Lord of the Rings who's just a dark lord in living in the tower of Barad-dûr uh, wanting to be evil just because he's evil that's it's good fantasy I suppose but maybe a little less realistic no one sees themselves as evil they might r recognize that other people call them evil but Nietzsche is saying here at least in the, the application of evil we call that which is evil that which we don't like especially when it suppresses us or even oppresses us that's what that's when we don't like it and that's what gives us the moniker of evil so even if we like you know once we get cross well that's bad that you did that you upset me now you're a bad person uh, like I said, politics happens all the time in the interchanging of power. Okay, let's now move on uh, to the last little bit here in book five. This is going to be on page 205. And so this and the next page are the, ne are the final passages of Daybreak that I want to look at, and the final ones in there in this collection. Again, the theme of this book, Daybreak, has been here he's given some diagnoses of the past here are things that we've done and here's why they're problematic and he's saying here's where we need to think about things and feel about things differently let's start with this he calls this the, the new passion he asks this question why do we fear and hate a possible reversion to barbarism so what's barbarism well Literally, I mean, not speaking Greek, um, but literally a, a time to a l less social cooperation. Might maybe, like Hobbes said, an uh, bellum omnia contra omnes, a war of all against all. Why does that seem scary to us? Why does it seem scary to where if people had were fighting each other in the street? Why is that scary? Or reverting to a less bureaucratic, a less organized, less centralized society? Why would that be bad? And someone's immediate response would be, well, here's why that would be bad, because people would be a lot less happy. Oh, no. <laughs> and he says this, listen, the barbarians of every age were happier. Let us not deceive ourselves. The reason is that our drive to knowledge has become too strong for us to be able to want happiness without knowledge or the happiness of a strong, firmly rooted delusion. Even to imagine such a state of things is painful to us. Restless discovering and divining has such an attraction for us and has grown as indispensable to us as is to the lower as to the lover his unrequited love which he would at no price l relinquish for a state of indifference. Ah, oh, perhaps indeed we too are unrequited lovers. So here's what he's saying here. We actually kind of exult in our own dissatisfaction. This kind of reminds me of Freud's notion of the Todestrieb, or the death drive. We are unhappy people today. Now, again, Nietzsche's writing this in 1881. Here we are almost, you know, 100, almost 140 years later. We're depressed, we're anxious, we're unhappy. Why? Well, because we're not children anymore. <laughs> now think about this. There's kind of a naivete that comes with childhood. One of the things that people might miss about childhood is that we were ignorant, naive we didn't know as much about the world and so it was a lot easier for us to be happy and a lot easier for us to be happy with a lot less now i, I i've seen you know some children I, I need this now sure but you can i mean little child you can give them you know a little toy and they can be contented for a while or an older child today put stick a phone in front of their face and let them play with it for a while so they'll, they'll be fine well as we get older though you'll find that the world becomes a more harrowing place it becomes uh, the world becomes a lot more sad a lot more depressing and we recognize there's a lot of there's a lot of problems both out there and in here in us but here's the thing 
and while that's terrible and you know as time goes on we become more and more depressed because you know God's dead <laughs> uh, he's gonna say that in the next book um, the the gay science but he, ha he hasn't so he hasn't said it explicitly yet but God's dead and there's a sense in which that fills us with a kind of melancholy he's gonna say there all right God's dead what are we gonna do we're murderers well I guess we're gonna have to do something new but at this point we actually almost like being depressed so consider this. I'll, I'll say this as a personal example. Have you ever cried so hard? I mean, I like legitimately been upset about something, but nevertheless, you looked in the mirror to see your own face while you were crying. Look at your own countenance. And <laughs> look, <laughs> look terrible. Why do we do that? Because there's a certain sense in which we enjoy our own misery. That seems like it, entirely counterintuitive. But he says this too. This is what he compares it to. He compares it to... Uh, unrequited love, where when someone is desperately uh, in, in unrequited love, where someone doesn't return, like you're in love with somebody, and they maybe it's not that they hate you, they're just mm, they're just not that into you, but that feeling of passion for someone else, I love you, like, like it might be people can define this in different ways. It might be a really extreme crush, it might be really a genuine sense of devotion. Like, I will do anything for you, and the other person's like, okay, whatever. Uh, they're, they're not returning it. The person who has that intense, passionate feeling of love, you'd think, if someone said, if someone came to them for for, for and said for free, I can delete all this pain and suffering that you're feeling. I can just delete all that pain, all that suffering, uh, and delete your ever having met or known this person. Like not right now. I can just and let's assume it's successful. Like I can just delete all this from your brain. You never met this person. All this pain will just go away. And let's assume we can also know, for the sake of argument, that this love will never be requited. Like, it, it's, never, it's never going to happen. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, we know all this. Nevertheless, the, un, the unrequited lover almost has their identity in their love for the other person. If given that opportunity, knowing that it's never going to work out, more than likely they're going to say, this is still who I am. Even though it's not going anywhere, this is, this is, part, this is part of me now. Nietzsche saying that's us as human beings, it's, and it's kind of stupid that we're so uh, enmeshed in our own misery that we take it as part of our identity, and we'd rather suffer than do anything about it. So the reason why we don't want to go back to the age of barbarism, it's not that barbarism is bad. Uh, people back then, like you go back uh, a thousand years, you'd be surprised how happy people are in their misery. Well, how do we know this? Look at the literature of the time. People during the plague, N not this one, but if you go back in the Middle Ages when a huge portion of Europe dying, all kinds of suffering, there's no modern medicine yet. People are surprisingly happy because it's all they know. It's almost, <laughs> as I've said it before, in much wisdom there is much sorrow. The more we know, the more disposed we are to be both bored, depressed, and disappointed at the advent of modern technology and convenience. It makes it far easier for us to, again, to be bored, disappointed, and depressed very, very easily. Uh, but yeah, you can see, if you ever visit uh, a country where people are impoverished, you'll find that people living in poverty, if they don't, they're not really, uh, sometimes impoverished people might not even be aware that they're living in poverty uh, because they have no sense of, elsewhere, I'm not saying that they're stupid, but they, they might not have a frame of reference. And they might have maybe one village shares a soccer ball, and that's it. They've all, it's deflated. That's all they've got. No shoes. You'd be surprised how often those children will smile, as opposed to those in overabundance who are easily bored. Going, you know, I think of the children in Willy Wonka. I want a pony. Uh, sometimes that, uh, that that privileged state leads us to that again constant disappointed disappointment because we're used to so much. You know, maybe if things went back a little bit, maybe if we reverted into barbarism, it might not be that bad. In fact, we might be happier as a result. It's, we think the things that make us happy, we, that is, we have a notion that we think certain things will make us happy when they do not.
and we acquire things to, to make us happy. That's why we make most of the purchases we make. This car will make me happy. This house will make me happy. This relationship will make me happy. This activity will make me happy. It's not going to make you happy. It might give you some nice memories. It might make you feel good in some ways. But it's not going to make you happy. Happiness is a state of mind for Nietzsche, and it's a certain kind of freedom that just the acquisition of stuff isn't going to do. I think some people have taken that way. People will take Nietzsche's notion of the ubermensch, which we haven't gotten to, and say this is the person that wants to consume everything, like some kind of atomos, uh, or so, some all-consuming cloud that's going to absorb everything. I don't think that's Nietzsche's ubermensch uh, at all. Uh, we haven't gotten quite to that yet. But this is not, that's not, that's not Nietzsche. Uh, I, I don't think. Um, he says maybe even, listen, uh, perhaps mankind will even perish of this passion for knowledge. Okay, maybe we're, we want stuff so badly, that's what's, that we want knowledge so badly, or pursue science so much that it'll kill us. Um, but did Christianity ever shun such a thought? Are love and death not brothers? Yeah, we hate barbarism. We would all prefer the destruction of mankind to a regression of knowledge. No, we can't go back to that. Again, like the unrequited lover, we'd rather stay in our misery than delete the memories that constitute who we think we are. And finally, if mankind does not perish of a, pa perish of a passion, it will perish of a weakness. Which do you prefer? This is the main question. Do we desire for mankind to end in a, f in a fire and light? Or one in the sand. I reminded of the words of Neil Young here, <laughs> right? Um, and Neil Young's has a song. I want to say it's uh, "Into the Black." Is that what I think it's called? Where he says, uh, "It's better to it's better to burn out than to fade away." So, do you want to go out with a bang, or do you want to go out with a fizzle? What should humanity do? Listen, if we're all going to die anyway, do you want to go out, like, make it look awesome, or are we just going to be like a dud? Let's go in fire and light. Let's not go in the sand. If we're going to go out, we're going to go out, in a, in a, again, you might hear this expression too, in a blaze of glory. Let's do it. And that brings us to this last section that we're going to look at here just this last little bit where this is almost this is his final uh, I don't want to say imperative but maybe injunction to us that is Nietzsche we are at liberty to do there's a freedom that we have here that Nietzsche is telling us that there that and he's going to say this more in uh, the gay science the die Frohliche Wissenschaft that all this stuff all these diagnoses that he's made. Like here's, all, here's some of the problems that we've had with morality and politics and the way that we perceive the world. We have, we have a liberty, I don't want to say freedom in a metaphysical sense, like we're the ones making all the choices and there's no happenstance or chance or chaos out there that's in our control. He's not making that claim, but listen, you got a will, you got, you got some freedom to do some things. What does he say? One can, he says this, we are at liberty to do. He doesn't say what, he just, we, are, we, we have a freedom to do. One can dispose of one's drives like a gardener, and though few know it, cultivate the shoots of anger, pity, curiosity, vanity as productively and profitably as a beautiful fruit tree on a trellis. One can do it with the good or bad taste of a gardener and, as it were, in the French or English or Dutch or Chinese fashion. One can also let nature rule and only attend to a little embellishment and tidying up here and there. One can finally, without paying any attention to them all, let the plants grow up and fight their fight out amongst themselves. Indeed, one can take delight in such a wilderness and desire precisely this delight, though it gives one some trouble too. What's he saying here? When it comes to drives, you, you have the ability, if you want to just embrace them, you can do that. Let them grow. Great. You want to augment some drives and desires and diminish others and you're in the control to do that? So be it. You want to do it in, <laughs> in a French, English, Dutch, or Chinese way? Sure, you, you can do that. And he says, all this we are at liberty to do. But how many know we are at liberty to do it? So this is the distinction here. He's not saying that you shouldn't do something in a certain way. Or even, he might be making the claim here too, I think it's possible, like even some aspects of Christianity. 
there might be some moral aspects even you want to do fine but do them because you want to not because you think you're not not compelled to do so from within but impelled to do so from without don't be of a mind that anyone's making you do it do it for yourself we're at liberty to do but how many know we're at liberty to do you want to be a confucian be a confucian be a buddhist be a buddhist Okay, whatever it is you want to do, fine, but do it for yourself. I know why. Don't just merely be, uh, as I know people will say, a, a sheep. And Nietzsche is going to use, that. he's already used that language of herd and sheep. Don't just be a follower. You can do something without being merely a follower, without merely just subscribing to it, especially in an inactive way. Like, I just do it because that's what we grew up doing. Stop it. Realize for yourself that you, you can do it, but you are free to choose to do so. Do the majority not believe in themselves as in f complete, fully developed facts? You're a you. When he, and so believe in yourself. Believe in yourself as yourself. Have the great philosophers not put their seal on this prejudice with the doctrine of the unchangeability of character. Well, this goes back to the view that Nietzsche would say is mistaken, that people are reducible to a moment in their lives okay like like it like i said before um nietzsche's saying here people are dynamic they can change they're not just who they are in a particular moment we do this often we say like again when someone committed a crime if they committed a crime they are that crime someone stole something they're, they are a thief someone killed someone they are a murderer but we don't do this with other things like we don't say like someone graduated kindergarten they're a kindergartner that's who they are well, that's who you were, and it's indicative of a particular moment when you were in kindergarten. Um, we also might, and some, sometimes we do this with other things that we like, but we don't do that with kindergarten, but we do it with college. Like, I, I am a college graduate. That's who I am. But we don't do it with other things, okay? We don't say, oh, um, <laughs> you know, someone used the bathroom. They're a shitter. Can you imagine if we did that? How, how ridiculous is that? That's exactly what Nietzsche is saying, that there's been a prejudice and a bias here where people have, people have been indicted by moments of their life as though this is what they are and also consigned to this, this is who you are. It might be this is the caste you were born into, that's who you are, that's where your identity is. He's just saying this. Change the way we think about it. We don't have to subscribe to circumstance, but we have a inherent nobility to ascribe to ourselves a freedom to do what it is that we desire to do, especially when it comes to constituting ourselves as persons and also to conceiving of what is good for us, morality, because we can't simply buy into pre-existent systems that are just there, okay? That's not freedom, that's consignment. And so what we'll be looking at next is his next piece from 1882, uh, Die Frohliche Wissenschaft, or The Gay Science. So, uh, again, if you have any questions, thomasbusca.edu. Uh, look forward to seeing some feedback on your Nietzsche papers uh, in the upcoming weeks.